Timor City Council will come to order. First uh, item on the agenda is roll call. Clerk. Council Member Baker. Here. Council Member Marshall. Present. Council Member Kugler. Present. Council Member Shrebnik. Here. Mayor Herbig. Here. Deputy Mayor O'Kane. Present. Council Member File. Present. All present. Would you all please stand and join me in the flag salute. Next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Unless there's any objections, the agenda will stand approved as published. Seeing no objections, the agenda stands approved. Um, next, we have presentations. Uh, first, we have a presentation recognizing the Wallace Swamp Creek Adopt-A-Park group. Ms. Brown? Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tonight, we wanna to recognize the Snow King Watershed Council for their participation in the city's Adopt-A-Park program. This past Friday, November 25th, Snow King Watershed Council celebrated three years since the adoption of Wallace Swan Creek Park. I wanna congratulate Snow King. Oh, sure. <laughs> I want to congratulate Snow King Watershed on this milestone and thank this group for their partnership and commitment to Wallace Swamp Creek Park. Uh, through the city's Adopt a Park program, residents, businesses, and nonprofit groups uh, volunteer to adopt a specific park and help keep our treasured public lands healthy, clean, and accessible for the community to enjoy. Uh, the volunteer group is led by Tracy Banaszewski. Her passion and energy make this park adoption so successful. She's organized over 50 park cleanups at Wallace Swamp Creek Park. Uh, here's an excerpt from their website. We do this work on the ancestral land of the first peoples of this region, the Coast Salish, the Stiligwamish, the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the Sammamish peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who are very much alive and present as good stewards of this land to this day. It is with gratitude to and because of them that we have the honor of tending to this land with the hope of restoring it to a healthy native ecosystem where native insects, fish, birds, and mammals, including humans, can be sustained and thrive for generations to come. We want to thank Tracy and the Snow King uh, Watership Council for their partnership and dedication. Their work at Wallace Swamp Creek Park is a love note to the city. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite Tracy up here to uh, get a certificate and a picture. Next on the agenda, Bus Rapid Transit and King County Metro presentations presented by Bus Rapid Transit Program Executive Bernard Vandekamp, King County Metro Transit Service Planner Yinying Huang Fernandez, and King County Metro Community Engagement Lead Luke Distelhorst. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Bernard Vandekamp. Uh, program executive for the Stride Bus Rapid Transit Program at Sound Transit. Thank you for having me this evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, 
I have a brief slideshow that I'd like to walk you through to uh, re-familiarize you with the program. Uh, particularly, I, I believe there are some new city council members since the last time there was an update. Um, and also give you an idea of what is coming next. Uh, we have a very uh, aggressive time frame for implementing this program. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to that. We go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, why I'm here this evening, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time just very briefly going over the background. Uh, the city of Kenmore and residents in the area were uh, very strong advocates for the program. Um, so I'd like to revisit that to give some context. Um, I'd like to also give a overview of the overall project on 522 and the broader program. And then we do have a number of upcoming community engagement uh, activities in the new year that I'd like to share with you and uh, finally finish with some of the uh, King County and Sound Transit uh, partnerships that are bringing transit to your community. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the history of the uh, SR 522 bus rapid transit project uh, dates back several years to the formation of the ST3 plan. Uh, in 2016, and uh, actually, I think it was roughly a year before then that, that much of the discussion began. Uh, the community was quite clear that, uh, that high capacity transit, similar to uh, bus rapid transit or light rail, um, commuter rail, should be implemented so that there was a permanent facility or permanent services on the 522 corridor. Uh, the, we went ahead and put up the picture of the yellow shirts, um, and I know your city manager was involved in that. Uh, that resonated with our board of directors, and the project was incorporated into the ST3 plan. Uh, and that, in a nutshell, is to link uh, the UW of Bothell area along 522 and then to the South Shoreline light rail station that's under construction now on 145th with service along all the uh, cities and communities in between. So uh, that, that was incorporated into the ST3 package. Um, I'd like to just again note um, the city manager and also others in the community pushed very hard for that. And uh, we still recognize the yellow shirts of 522 Transit now. Um, that was incorporated into the overall ST3 program. And as I'm sure you're aware, that was approved by voters in November of 2016. Uh, we got to work on it almost immediately by beginning project development, uh, looking at what are the, uh, the appropriate station locations, what were we up against, uh, began our environmental work and engineering, and then along came the pandemic. And uh, we, we needed to take, a, shouldn't say a pause, but we certainly needed to slow things down while our board of directors took in, uh, what does that mean to revenues? Uh, what does that mean to the overall program? And uh, that resulted with a, a tiering of um, categorization of different projects in the plan. And um, I'm happy to say that the 522 BRT project ended up in the uh, category one or tier one, which is essentially translates to go forward in haste, uh, without haste and get the project done. So we, as of, uh, the board's realignment decision in August of 2021. We had a lot of decisions that were queued up and took those to our board and have been making a lot of uh, very quick uh, progress very aggressively since then. Um, so that, that's the background of uh, what we're, and maybe we should go on to describe a little bit more clearly of what BRT intends to do. So if go on to the next slide, please. Uh, the STRIDE program, uh, next slide. Uh, Stride Bus Rapid Transit is planned to open in the 2026 or 27 timeframe. I have advised the board that we are currently trending to 2027, so I do want to share that, and we are making every effort we can to accelerate on that. But the program overall uh, will comprise of three service lines, uh, S1, S2, and S3. The S1 line will connect uh, Bellevue and Burien. So that's kind of the south end uh, and all the, all the communities in between that will be operating on I-405 primarily, and then the new express toll lanes that are being constructed between Renton and Bellevue. Uh, and that will uh, terminate at the Bellevue Transit Center. 
The S2 line will, uh, will begin or end at the uh, Bellevue Transit Center and reach the Linwood Transit Center, um, serving uh, Kirkland and Bothell along the way. There will be a connection with the S3 line, which formerly was known as 522 BRT. There'll be a connection in the uh, 405 522 interchange area next to UW Bothell. And then, as I mentioned earlier, S3 will uh, travel along 522 to the 145th corridor out to the light rail station um, at South Shoreline. Uh, I want to point out that the, aside from South Shoreline light rail connection, there will also be connections at Linwood, uh, downtown Bellevue, and at the existing Tuckwill International Boulevard light rail station. Uh, so this, uh, this Stride BRT system will have connections to the expanding light rail system. And also we are, uh, we are going to lengths to make sure that we have good connections to community transit services. Um, they have swift BRT under construction and operational now. King County Metro also has extensive services throughout the region. So we are sizing our stations to accommodate our partners, um, local transit services and also developing uh, systems that will share information about those services to our riders and vice versa. Uh, we go on to the next slide, please. We'll go on to the, uh, the program elements. Um, bus rapid transit is, uh, I mentioned earlier, high capacity, high capacity transit. We view that as uh, the highest level of service that Sound Transit offers. These are permanent investments. So uh, bus rapid transit is essentially on par with light rail. We are building these to have a 100-year uh, future and be a permanent fixture in the community. And that also goes for the service levels. Uh, we will be providing bus service every 10 minutes uh, on the 522 corridor. That will be regardless of whether it's at the peak or off peak. And the span of service will be the equivalent of light rail. Um, that means that we will be operating 19 hours a day, Monday through Saturday, 17 hours a day on Sundays. We want to make sure that we match the service levels to light rail uh, so that those, those passengers that are riding to uh, South Shoreline, they're not waiting for a half hour for a bus. They have an immediate connection to our uh, BRT system. So that, that's the nature of the service. It will be high frequency, high quality. We are developing our stations and across the entire 45 mile system that we're developing, there will be 26 stations. Uh, those will feature amenities very similar to light rail, uh, passenger amenities such as uh, information boards, um, active information boards. We want to do off board fare payment so that when the coach pulls up, we don't have folks uh, queuing up and standing in line for five minutes or longer to get on the bus. We want folks to get in and out of there quickly so that we can maintain our, our speed and reliability. Uh, so in terms of the capital investments, this program really comprises of two uh, significantly different types of BRT. On the 405 corridor, we will be operating very high speed with uh, stations spaced uh, fairly distant from one another. And they'll be operating the express toll lanes uh, with, with ramps to and from those. On the 522 corridor, we will be completing the uh, business and transit lanes that have already been built. Much of those are already complete in the city of Kenmore, but we will be completing uh, the gaps. So we have gaps um, in uh, Lake Forest Park are probably the most geographically challenging, but we want to have continuous bat lanes so that we have that speed and reliability and can bypass general purpose uh, traffic congestion. Uh, on, the 40, on the 145th corridor, we will not be widening the entire corridor with a new lane. Rather, we will be uh, providing Q bypasses or uh, widened intersections when, as the uh, BRT vehicles pull up, they'll be able to bypass the, uh, the traffic queues and get to the stations. Uh, in order to, uh, speed and reliability is really uh, important to BRT. So those are some of the capital investments to ensure that we can get past the traffic. We're also going to be uh, working with each of the jurisdictions, including Kenmore, 
to ensure that we have signal priority. And that essentially is a way of saying uh, when the bus or the BRT coach pulls up to a light, a traffic signal, we get priority. We either get uh, an extended green light to get us through that to the next station, or we get an early green. And the intent here is really to uh, keep the, the BRT system moving as quickly and reliably as possible. So that, that is a conversation that is coming. Um, we are we are focused on the capital investments right now, but are quickly shifting towards the operational aspects uh, in the coming months. Next slide, please. Uh, the fleet and stations um, have some graphics here that are showing some mock-ups of what our stations will look like. So in the top right is a representation of one of our stations on the 522 corridor. These are uh, reflective of some of the branding so that there's a common uh, theme so folks are not confused about where these stride BRT stations are, what they look like and how they function. There will be consistency across all 26 stations that we build. Uh, they will again feature uh, in passenger information that will be in real time. Uh, passengers that are waiting will know when the next bus is coming and they'll have a lot a lot of information about uh, connecting services, whether it be light rail or um, our partner's services. Uh, we are looking, like I mentioned, to have offboard fare payment. Um, we, are, we are also looking to uh, simplify that with the new ORCA cards that are, that are in circulation now. Uh, I, I also wanna point out that we are going to have two types of vehicles. On the 522 corridor, we will have the 60 foot articulated coaches. Um, those are the similar to the types that we use out there now. Uh, the interior and exterior will look different. It will function different from what you see today. And also note that on 522, we have committed to operating battery electric buses. So uh, it should be a, a cleaner and quieter uh, vehicle for the route. This is the first time that Sound Transit has uh, gotten into battery electric buses. So we are, we're quite excited to do that. And, uh, and we'll be uh, installing quite a bit of uh, infrastructure to support those services to make sure that they work, they're reliable for, for the passengers. On the, five, uh, on the 405 corridor, we are going to be using double-decker coaches. They're better suited to higher speeds. And frankly, our existing passengers love them. They've made it very clear that they would like to see those in the future. Uh, we are working on the uh, propulsion type for those right now and expect to be making a decision on whether those will be diesel or battery electric and uh, expect to be taking that forward to our executives and our board of directors in the coming months. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So community engagement, um, as I mentioned, we, we got started several years ago on this project and on this program. We have been re trying to reach out to uh, all that will listen to us and everyone that has a, uh, should have a voice in developing these permanent facilities and, and uh, services. So we have tried to maintain a robust outreach and community engagement. We, did, we were set back somewhat during the pandemic for uh, obvious reasons that folks did not uh, meet in person, but we did have a lot of success with online open houses, had a lot of participation at that point. Um, we, we are now uh, at the 60% design milestone. So things are well-defined. We have a very good idea of uh, how and where this will be built, uh, meaning the specifics of what type of property acquisitions will be necessary to allow for this uh, project to be built. So it is a, uh, while we're at 60% design, we are not at 100%. And I just wanna pause for a moment there on that point that uh, at 60% design, we know what our, our footprint will be, uh, what type of utilities need to be moved, uh, fairly specific where, what we will build and where. But we do not know enough about individuals' properties to understand everything about those. So we, we are really reaching out to all of the individual property owners uh, right now, and we'll continue to do so over the coming months to understand uh, the nuances of their property. Um, we, we like to get permission from them to uh, set foot on the property, understand what's there, 
um, what we, you know, understand what we can't tell from aerial photographs and from windshield surveys and really talk with the property owners and, and understand how we can uh, modify the design to really best fit um, the environment. So that is ongo ongoing right now. Uh, we have also shared our 60% designs online. So those are available for anyone to take a look at. And we are waiting to do uh, open houses and broad drop-in sessions with um, residents and business members in the community until after the holidays. Uh, we, we found from experience that we just don't get a good turnout during the holidays uh, season for, for fairly obvious reasons. Folks have their minds on other things. So in the uh, February and March timeframe, we will be uh, conducting a number of open houses and drop-in sessions for folks to come and visit uh, throughout the corridor in addition to our normal outreach. Uh, next slide, please. So that, that concludes my overview. Um, I would be happy to take any questions or dive into more detail to, to the extent that you'd like me to do that this evening. Questions? Councilmember Shrebnik. Thank you for um, coming and presenting. Um, it's great to hear that things are moving forward, uh, even though it looks like it might still be five more years or thereabouts until we get to the goal, which sounds great. Um, I'm super excited about it. Um, I, I just want to take us back just for a minute. I mean, pre pandemic, um, I and I think maybe a couple of others um, here were daily bus riders. Um, I, I did for more than 15 years um, and it was great. <laughs> we had fantastic bus service here. In fact, it was something that we would tell other people in the community is we could get on a bus and we'd be downtown in 35 minutes. I have to say at well, downtown UW or First Hill, and, you know, there's a lot of good paying jobs in those locations. And we now, I don't know if this is simply association, but our um, household income is in Kenmore is about 50% higher than the household income King County wide. And I have to think that having fantastic transit is a piece of that puzzle. Um, since the pandemic, and I, I can only imagine the struggles that you're facing with putting the puzzle pieces together under the kind of revenue issues that you've faced. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I have to say the bus service has really deteriorated by design. Um, and I know it's a combination. We used to have both um, one seat bus on Metro, which I know you don't represent Metro, um, and one seat bus service on Sound Transit. So it was, it was truly fantastic. You'd go down to the bus stop and a bus would appear. Um, and not only don't we have that anymore, we have no one bus service, to, one, excuse me, one seat service um, without a transfer, in other words, to downtown through either either program, Metro or um, Sound Transit. Um, but regardless of the mechanism that the transfer occurs, it takes 50% longer to get downtown. You know, and that starts to get competitive with driving. Um, and the whole purpose of transit is to get people out of their cars and moving in a different way. So I guess, you know, I, I know it's going to be great <laughs> when it's done. Is there anything that can be done in the next five years <laughs> in this interim period um, to, to get us to a better level of service? Um, I, you know, at minimum, for example, I, you know, one of the most rugged things was when I've transferred at Roosevelt um, in the driving rain. Um, with, you know, no coverage, no wayfinding, you're kind of following the, the next, you know, jacketed person in front of you um, for several blocks. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it is not a smooth um, 
easy transfer. Um, and I know it's going to be a 145th, but again, is uh, I guess the question is, is there anything that can smooth that out or to improve our service? And one of the ways I've thought of is, you know, through the Metro bus 322, which I think is not sound transit. I believe that's Metro. Yeah, it's the only remaining one seat bus that goes anywhere near downtown. So I'll leave that for the Metro person. Um, but um, if there's anything on the sound transit side that can improve our level of service, I'd love to hear it. Sorry, that was a long lecture. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I appreciate that. And I, I, I do hear you. Uh, I know the sound transit also hears you and is aware of the uh, situation out there. Um, it, it is a little bit of an awkward transition period and I can appreciate there's frustration during, you know, there's, there's good things on the horizon, but folks are dealing with things today. So uh, the intent has been to ensure that we get as, as reliable of a trip as possible. Um, that's part of the advantage of having folks transfer to light rail in uh, the Roosevelt Air Station. Um, I do know that since the November 21 opening of the Northgate extension and the transition of the 522 to the Roosevelt station, um, the, the service for light rail has been adjusted somewhat to try and get better connections so that uh, there aren't these big gaps. Uh, and there have been some improvements in the Roosevelt station area with better shelters. Um, we, we are working with the city of Seattle to make some additional improvements um, to pedestrian facilities to make things more visible uh, so that folks aren't in the dark and, you know, you know, trying to improve the safety as well by better lighting and whatnot. Uh, we do have service changes twice a year. I know that our service planners that uh, concentrate on, on the 522 service and, and other sound transit routes are aware of this and trying to improve this situation. Um, a part of what we're struggling with, and I think the entire uh, transit industry is dealing with it right now, is a, a very severe shortage of transit operators. Uh, we, we're seeing it ourselves. We're having to cancel a lot of uh, services or runs uh, for different routes, and I know that's also the case for uh, King County Metro, Pierce Transit, and Community Transit. So I wish that I could come in here tonight and say we've got, we've got a solution that we'll be putting in place right away, but uh, we're working on it. We are aware of it, um, and we're, we are trying to make some improvements with the resources we have. So, um, and I would imagine when the King County Metro folks uh, uh, take the dais here that they, they'll have additional information for you, because we are trying to work together on this corridor and get the best we can out of it. Councilmember Baker. Yes. Um, is, I, I would been looking at the 60% design uh, photos and um, which businesses are liable to be affected by some of the construction that will happen here in Kenmore? Uh, well, we have, let me check my notes here on the exact number, but uh, I do know that we have taken forward a number of, um, we, we call them our packages of properties that are usually around 50 properties at a time um, for authorization with the board of directors. So we've done four of those at this point. Uh, there's one more coming in January, and I believe the January uh, package will include a few more uh, Kenmore businesses. But we do know that uh, some, just as right down the street here, uh, will be affected. Um, part of the 60% design effort is to, again, get an idea of what's going on, um, how those businesses operate. Uh, for example, the, the businesses down here, we're going to be building a station in front of them. So we do expect to need to relocate those businesses. Um, because their driveways will be blocked and it's not possible to build that station without having that effect. Uh, there are some others where uh, as we continue to move through design and have those conversations, are there remedies for impacts that we might have on some of these businesses? Um, because a lot of these are partial acquisitions. We might be buying a few feet of the property for the, um, 
for the project needs and whether that has a uh, such a drastic effect on the business that it's just simply not possible to operate those businesses any further uh, that's that's part of the conversation that we need to have is understand how they operate how we might be able to modify uh, things so that so that we don't um, result with a relocation or a, a full acquisition of those businesses. Um, I believe there are 11 um, commercial properties in Kenmore that are affected uh, by the project, 11 total. Okay. Um, yeah, I was referring to, I think basically the two that where a station is gonna be built that will affect the egress. Yes. of the business. But anyway, uh, I'm very happy to see that this is going to be the first all electric bus route um, in the state. That uh, That's exciting and I can't wait for that to happen. But I'm understanding, uh, I was on Wi-Fi for the last meeting and so as a result, I got bits and pieces of it. Um, but my concern is Real estate prices are going higher. Labor and construction costs are going up. And the ST3 route was one of the ones that has consistently stayed under budget. And delaying this, and I don't think the board delayed it more than, than 26, but I do understand construction issues I have the cement strike that's still affecting us. And, and uh, so I do understand it. And 27 is still realistic, but we've got a neighbor that's wanting this whole project delayed until 2044. And I find that very distressing. So, Without going into specifics, any thoughts on, on, the, on the possibility? Or are we really looking at 2027 at this point? Uh, um, thank you, Council Member Baker. And um, he's referring to the uh, board meeting that happened uh, about a week ago. Yep. Uh, we, we, heard, we have heard from several residents, um, primarily in the Lake Forest Park uh, community that are concerned about right-of-way impacts uh, to residences and businesses. Um, I mentioned earlier, it's a very difficult stretch uh, with a lot of residences that are right up next to the existing right-of-way, steep, uh, lots of tree impacts, and we will need to build a number of large retaining walls. Um, so it is a very complicated piece of the corridor. Uh, we have, as, as we have in Kenmore, we have been reaching out to the community regularly and trying to keep them informed um, and are working with the, uh, the, the property owners out there to really understand what's going on. Um, very steep driveways, how can we remedy those as part of our project and so forth. We did have a few folks um, that testified that they would like that stretch of the project to be postponed to 2044. Uh, that would coincide with the timing of the uh, park and ride uh, in Lake Forest Park. Um, our board did vote to proceed with um, what the action for the day was to um, another one of these right of way packages that included some homes, um, not entire homes, but there were some properties that uh, are in Lake Forest Park. Our board did vote to proceed. Um, we, we are anticipating that in January, we will be coming back with another set of properties. Um, in that case, there will be a large number in Lake Forest Park. So um, we, are, we are trying to really get out there and talk with the community, make sure that folks have improved communication and back and forth. Um, I have not heard any indication from our board that they want to postpone any part of this project. I think the BRT is really reliant on these bat lane uh, investments. Um, each one of them makes a contribution, some of them small, some of them large. The, uh, the northbound bat lane that is planned in that stretch of Lake Forest Park, again, will be complicated, but it is really key to having a speed and reliability. So uh, from a project perspective, um, we, we view it as, very important to build that piece. Um, 
And we are committed to continuing to have these conversations and make things right when we come in and uh, have to acquire some of this property. It's not something that we like to do. So uh, we try to be very careful about minimizing that and getting a good fit in the community. Um, so to, to be more direct of an answer to your question, we believe that um, 2027 is realistic in its entirety, including battery electric buses. And uh, we are viewing that as full completion of the entire line so that we're, we're starting with a complete project rather than trying to phase it in piece by piece. Yeah, I, I, I believe I've heard that there's some council that was saying 2044 also. Um, can the route function if that section isn't completed? Uh, it, I think that we, we can make things work as they are today. Uh, but the intent of the project is to get a high capacity transit system in place that uh, is, is reliable, has good speed. Um, we just off the cuff, some of the consequences would be a much slower travel, um, much more prone to congestion. And then there are also other, uh, that, that would also trigger a larger fleet of coaches to make up for those longer travel times. So um, I think it would, it would water down the effectiveness of the program. And our, our board has been clear with the decisions they've made to date that they want to build the entire project. They want to build, build the entire uh, Stride BRT program, 405 and 522, and the bus base and operations center that is required as part of it, so. As you well understand, important to Kenmore to get this done. It was originally, the, I think, was 2024, then pushed to 25 and 26, and now 27. So each one of these delays, uh, I, I'm I'm very concerned. So that's why I try and keep on top of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember File. Thank you. I, you know, I appreciate that you've come out this way and uh, the amount of engagement you have done in the past. I, I certainly would like to see uh, more targeted um, universal approaches at ground zero. I'm, I'm very favorable of meeting our community where they're at. And so I, I'm sure that we would welcome an opportunity to, to have a engagement uh, with our community and partners and stakeholders you know, whether it's here in this facility or another one within our community, uh, we have to work together for common goals and what we can do um, to help support that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm behind that fully. Um, because we need those voices at the table. We can't do this without them. Uh, I think also about uh, the environmental impacts. Uh, we have, very high standards of environmental uh, concerns and, and meeting those uh, environmental uh, goals in Kenmore along with our, our regional connected goals. And in looking at um, the sound transits uh, goals and um, values on environment, um, in salmon uh, corridors, uh, what are you doing to uh, improve the outcomes for salmon? We, we have many runs that run straight towards Lake Washington. I would hope that um, areas that will likely have connection with the project underway and development would have improvements along those lines. Absolutely. Um specific to salmon. Well, actually, I'll, I'll just like to uh, say thank you for um, the, the partnership with the city has been very strong and we intend to uh, continue that. We really appreciate working with city manager, Carl Lindsay, uh, over the years. We do have a number of drop-in sessions planned in the February, March timeframe. So we'll continue to uh, coordinate with your staff to make sure that we're, we're proximate to uh, folks in Kenmore and, and Bothell and the other jurisdictions. Um, now, as far as the environmental impacts, uh, we, 
we do uh, follow the lead of permitting requirements for each of the lo local jurisdictions along the way. Uh, we are also trying to um, merge our efforts with the Washington State Department of Transportation, which is responsible for removing a number of fish barriers uh, along the corridor. So while not all of those will happen at the exact same time, we are trying to coordinate so that we have um, one go at construction. We're not having the state come out and fix a fish barrier and then follow a year later and disrupt the whole corridor again. But um, those are in the near term and that's, that's improving a lot of the fish uh, barriers and trying to open up a lot of the upstream habitat, uh, which is part of salmon recovery. Uh, also note that as we build out the corridor, we do it to the highest level or the highest standard. Um, and those are more and more um, uh, demanding over time. So, you know, decades ago, we would just uh, send all the uh, storm water into the lake untreated. That is not how we do it now. We need to build vaults uh, to catch the runoff and filter it or ponds and uh, other, other measures to try and clean up the water and uh, make it more habitable for salmon. So uh, th that's that's part of the design. It's part of the requirements, and um, that combined with what we're doing with the state, we think we're going to leave it better than than we started. Okay, and so that would also include fish passable uh, salmon coverts or fish passable coverts, right? Yes. Um, the other thing is uh, safety and security, not just at um, light rail stations but uh, within the community uh, upon the new built out areas, what does that look like exactly? You mentioned it, but you didn't really lean into that. The, uh, the safety and security at, at stations and also on coaches. Um, we are going to have uh, various monitoring at our stations. Uh, we will not necessarily have them staffed with a, uh, a security guard uh, at all times. Um, we'll have to see how things go, that if there are problem areas, and we'll certainly respond. But uh, we will have ticket vending machines at the majority of our stations, and um, that requires cash handling. It, uh, so there's a safety liability or risk there. So we will have closed caption uh, television uh, recording what's going on. Uh, we have folks at, we will have folks at our maintenance space that are monitoring those. Not necessarily watching each one constantly, but uh, they'll rotate them through as they do with light rail. Um, so, and on coaches themselves, we are going to have folks out in the field that will help with security. Uh, each bus will have an automatic vehicle locator, so we know exactly where it is, and we will have good, good, better communications than we do today with our operators so that if there ever is a problem, we'll be able to get to it quickly or notify the local uh, police to um, to intervene if it's an emergency situation. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, some of the concerns I've heard from uh, families and even youth within the community is about taking uh, the rapid transit, the the light tra the light rail, excuse me, and uh, you know traveling through a community. It, it used to be that. Um, you know, our teens and our tweens could jump on a bus and feel pretty safe. It's not necessarily the same thing at a light rail station, um, just because of the different issues that uh, our region is facing. Um, and so there's a different kind of presence. And, and I'll be very honest, I've even heard my sons talk about their comfort in riding alone or being at the Northgate station and versus having somebody travel with them. And so there's, there's an element and there's lack of surrounding security um, to address that. And I think that's something that needs to have further thought and consideration. Uh, also, it takes a long time to get to downtown Seattle and other parts of our community, whether you're, you're crossing over to Kirkland. Um, we're seeing youth who used to ride the bus more go towards cars because it doesn't it's not time conductive uh, anymore that's it's counterproductive um, and so I want to make sure we're seeing our next generation engage healthy safe transportation which is what we are working towards 
um, and partnering that together so that we can have safe outcomes for our community and, and our, our future generations. So uh, last thing, uh, housing. We have a lot of uh, housing booming around our area and in Kenmore. Uh, and of course we have a work yet to be done in our TOD. Uh, I'm concerned about um, in, you know, ensuring that there's uh, access to transportation without the limitations of having um, ridership you know, being blocked off with uh, cars that are, are taking up the spots due to housing issues. So uh, any ideas of how you're gonna work with those kinds of situations with parking? Yeah, um, well, the, the, there is a um, planned investment at the Kenmore Park and Ride of adding uh, 300 stalls to that existing uh, facility. It also presents a good transit-oriented development, uh, expanding the residential um, apartments or whatnot in that footprint. So we have been teamed up with King County Metro. Uh, we have folks that work regularly on these types of projects, as does King County Metro. Um, so while the, the park and ride investment is planned for 2034, we are trying to figure out ways that we might be able to entice uh, private investment or affordable housing uh, being built in that location and possibly accelerating that park and ride investment. So uh, we have not set it all aside to say, well, we'll come back to it in 10 years, but rather we're, we're trying to lean into it because we do understand from our board of directors that they'd like to see some innovation, some ideas brought forward. Uh, the, the reason for the park and ride delay was for financial purposes uh, to, to balance our books. So if there are partner dollars or contributions that can be made that would accelerate it, uh, I believe our board is uh, open to that. Um, we're, we're investigating those and are really trying to work with the communities, Kenmore, uh, Bothell, Renton, other communities to try and make something happen sooner uh, through partnerships. So, so we have not forgotten about it. Um, also note that in, in some instances where we acquire properties and we only need a part of it, uh, we had the discussion earlier about sometimes we have a big enough impact that it renders a business or a residence uh, unusable. We, and we end up with a lot of uh, surplus land and we do have policy that directs us to uh, make an offering to affordable housing first. So um, that that is another potential venue in the future once we're done building the project to uh, release some of that. Thank you. Okay. Councilor McCougler. Thank you so much for coming to speak today. Um, will you be staying until after the King County Metro presentation? I would be happy to. Certainly. Okay, great, because I do have some questions and comments that I think relate to both agencies, so I'd like to save my comments for after. Great. That's okay. Thank you. Well, I, for one, would just like to say that um, I still have my yellow shirt, and I'm very much looking forward to wearing it when this line opens. Um, unless there's anything else, let's go to the next part of the presentation, then. Uh, good evening, council members. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? We can see you. We can hear you. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Pleasant Brown, and I am the government relations jurisdictional lead over here at King County Metro. And we're excited to present um, where we are in Kenmore right now and future projects. I will hand it over to my colleague, Yingying Juan Fernandez, to introduce herself, but to please know that she's off camera tonight due to an injury. Um, but we look forward to talking with you and we look forward to also fielding questions at the end of the presentation. Take it away, Yingying. Thank you, Amanda, and hello, council members. Um, I will go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Yingying Juan Fernandez and I am the um, project manager for the Linwood Link Connections Mobility Project. 
Um, I'm also a service planner with King County Metro. So for today's presentation, I like to just go over a few things. One is to um, just remind folks of our Metro's long range vision. Um, this is a uh, long range service and capital vision, which sort of points to the directions that Metro would like to go you know, in the long range future. Um, there, as you can see in this um, map on the right, that in this 2050 network vision, um, we are going to see some frequent service on the Juanita Drive Northeast, Ballinger Way, and the 522 corridor. All of these are existing corridors that have services, and um, the 2050 network is showing a vision of higher frequency along these corridors. In, in addition to this, um, we are also showing in the vision um, some local services that are providing more coverage in Camor uh, city proper. And those are those yellow lines that you can see uh, north and south of Camor. So some of the streets that will, um, that this map is actually showing. I know the street names are not there, but some of the streets are Simons Road Northeast, the 68th Avenue Northeast, um, and the Northeast 192nd Street. So compared to today, that's an expanded level of service on existing corridors as well as new local coverage. Um, and more can be read um, on the Long Range Transit Plan on our King County Metro Vision, Metro Vision website. So please go to the next slide here. Okay, thank you. So I just want to note um, an important point about the Metro Connects Long Range Vision, and that is that the Metro Connects outline a service network that is currently unconstrained by the capital and operational limitations and is not fully funded. So realizing and refining the Metro Connect vision for our region's future transit system will take strong partnerships with cities like um, yourselves and other partners. Um, and those strong partnerships are especially important in the areas of helping to fund and deliver the capital and operational resources, and also helping to engage and better understand the mobility needs of our communities, especially our priority populations. So um, although the Metro Connects are important guides, community engagement will still drive the service changes that you will see you know, from year to year. And this is just because community needs are likely to change over time. Um, the Metro Long Range Vision, even though it gets updated, it does present a snapshot of time vision. So as we are going into really figuring out what the service should look like, for example, with some of the major um, regional transit con uh, connections coming into the region, for example, the Link Light Rail extension, as well as the 522 BRT. In these instances, um, the changes that we will be looking at and eventually implemented will be uh, informed by the community engagement that are conducted uh, through those processes. And we, we through those uh, engagement process, um, are committed to engaging communities of uh, priority population and also fully understanding you know, the different current mobility needs and trying to address them. So uh, that all being said, um, we are currently in the process of examining uh, network changes um, as we are looking forward to some of the major transit, uh, new regional transit investments that are coming online into this region. Um, and that is the Lingwood Link Connections Mobility Project. So this is one such effort that we will be examining changes to the network to better address the current mobility needs, as well as, um, as well as connecting to these future link light rail stations, as well as 522 BRT. Um, and this uh, network uh, restructure or study um, uses Metro, Con uh, Metro Connect's long-term vision as a starting point. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, they will inevitably look different just because it is informed by current engagement uh, findings, um, which informs what the needs are currently. 
as well as the uh, budget constraint and capital constraint that we're facing in the short term. So um, if you can please go to the next slide. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the Link with Link Connections Mobility Project, really looking at you know, what Metro is doing to um, evaluate and consider changes in the near five-year to six-year term. Um, and this project, as I mentioned earlier, is really related to some of these new regional transit investments that are coming to the north, uh, Northwest King County area. So that's both the link, uh, link with link extension, um, but also includes the 522 BRT and the 130th infill station. So all of this are coming in line, online, you know, in the next several years. Um, or is anticipated to come online in the next several years. So the project includes 22 routes that we're evaluating and studying for change. And we're seeking to deliver a um, updated mobility network uh, by the time different elements of the uh, sound transit service comes online. There are four project goals. Um, related to this project, which informs both our network planning approach and also our engagement approach. One is to improve the mobility for priority populations. Uh, and this is defined by the mobility framework and really highlights you know, where needs are the greatest in our King County. And so the priority populations are an important part of our current and potential customer base. And the second is equitably inform, engage, and empower current and potential customers traveling in the project area. And the third is deliver integrated service that responds to link expansion, changes in the transit network, and the community needs. And last but not least, uh, we're looking also to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, and environmental sustainability of our King County Metro network through these um, project efforts. So with that, um, I will hand it off to Luke Distelhorst, our engagement lead, to talk a little bit more about our project's engagement efforts. Thank you, Ying Ying, and good evening, council members and staff. Uh, my name is Luke Distelhorst. I'm a senior community engagement planner with King County Metro, and I'll just touch really briefly on uh, where we're at with our engagement around Linwood Link and uh, let you know that we'll be back hopefully in the near future. Earlier this year, you may have seen information and the survey around our phase one needs assessment that took place roughly January to May of 2022. We've used those results and working with our mobility board made up of community members and our partner review board made up of jurisdictions, uh, stakeholders, and partner agencies prioritize those needs to develop a concept network that we will take out to the public uh, in phase two in early 2023. Uh, phase two is really critical as it's the first time there are draft route lines on a map and possible route frequencies and spans of service to review. So from an engagement standpoint, it's where we can get really detailed feedback about what will or won't work uh, in addressing people's travel needs. Next slide, please. And for this phase two, we're currently planning different approaches for our different audiences. Uh, we've contracted with four community-based organizations to help lead outreach mainly with our equity priority populations. We'll have a strong public outreach plan, both in person and online, as well as have a few really focused meetings uh, with groups where there could be larger route changes or with populations that may have unique mobility needs. Lastly, we'll work again with our mobility and partner review boards after the public engagement phase ends to review results and see how we can adjust and improve the concept network into a proposed network that the public would review again in phase three, probably in late 2023. We're planning to be meeting with uh, various jurisdictional staff this December, and then we'll be reaching back out to city councils and local transportation groups when our public outreach launches 
um, so we can provide the best uh, kind of detailed presentation on what's included in that concept network, and then also sharing how uh, local Kenmore residents can best participate in our uh, public feedback opportunities. Uh, so this is really just a heads up to say we're going to be back really soon uh, with a lot more detailed information about how people can be a part of uh, phase two of our Linwood Link Connections Mobility Project. And with that, I think uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Um, it sounded like there may also be some, some questions for Sound Transit as well. Questions, Councilor Member Kubler. Okay, I have a bunch of random notes written on my notebook, so apologize if I if I don't ask these in an organized fashion. But first, I just want to say I'm really excited about the BRT coming hopefully in 2027. It's been um, you know many years, I think, before 2016 when it was approved, and I think um, we're looking forward to offering that service and having quick, speedy, reliable service right to the light rail. Um, I agree with what many of the other council members said. It has to be safe, convenient, um, and travel times have to be top of mind for, for our residents to be able to use it. Um, I feel like Kenmore is, is moving in a great direction and in, um, like in sync with, the, with this coming to our community in that we've been focusing on multimodal transportation in our city, building the infrastructure for it, making sure there are safe and convenient routes to our park and ride, to our bus stops, you know, to our downtown core. Um, and um, I'm hoping that, that both King County Metro and Sound Transit are really thinking like, into the future in terms of like the infrastructure for meeting our residents needs long terms like i'm excited about the investment in electric buses. I also hope that the new bike racks will be able to accommodate cargo bikes and also electric bikes as those change in size um, and needs. Um, I'm also hoping that the buses will be equipped with good air filtration ventilation people are really concerned about that you know post pandemic. Um, and there are two programs that exist right now that I'm super happy that both King County Metro and Sound Transit are participating in that I hope will be continued into the future. One is the Youth Ride Transit for free. Um, I know that that was funded um, like in a creative manner and hopefully that will continue as our youth get used to riding public transportation uh, frequently. I would love to see data about that ridership in the future. If either of your agencies come back to report on that again, we'd love to know how many people are taking advantage of that. The other is the community ride program, which, which I think is really an awesome service, but I have personally tried to use it several times and just found the times not very convenient. I hope that isn't indicative of everyone's experience with it. And I hope we might see that continue because it's basically like our mini version of you know, a ride share program um, and at a, an equally affordable cost. So I'm wondering if the community ride program is a pilot and for how long that's going to last and if there's the risk of losing that soon before we have um, uh, more, I guess, connectedness for that service. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, fortunately, cannot I don't have the full answers to the community rights future. Um, and I would say that as part of Lingua Link, however, we are keeping an open mind to the possibility of other type of transit services that are beyond fixed route. So it is helpful to hear that, you know, community rights might be a good service that is meeting our com uh, the community's needs here in Kenmore, and we will be open to continue to explore, um, you know, how to meet those maybe more of the flexible service needs um, through the Lingual Link project. So I apologize not being able to answer directly um, your question about the community rise. I'm happy to follow up. 
And I can add to council member that um, flexible services are continuing to grow. And I would point folks to Mount Jewel, we have any announcement after the beginning of the year that points to our flexible services and where they're going. So I will say stay tuned for that um, early next year. I don't know if we'll be able to do it by the time maybe we come back for the Linwood link, but I'd be happy to follow up when we do. Any other questions? I just have one thing I'd like to pass on, especially to, well, actually it's both. Um, so I spoke with, um, and I've heard uh, the Metro General Manager, um, White, um, start to describe Metro as a mobility agency. And I think that really is, I think that really is kind of where it needs to go in the future. Um, and as these major investments are made along 522 with, um, with the Sound Transit investments, um, we need to be doing what we can in Metro, I, I think needs to be doing what it can to make it easier for folks to access the sound transit investments. That's a lot of what you've been doing when you, um, when light rail opens is kind of restructured to feed into that line. Um, North Kenmore years ago, used to actually have a bus route that ran through it and got people to 522. That went away many, many, many years ago, uh, probably during the Great Recession, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, South Kenmore has some buses. North Kenmore does not really have access uh, on bus to 522. And I really hope that Metro will take a good hard look at ways, especially maybe even if it's just commuter uh, times, commute times, um, to open up that service to folks who otherwise um, just to give folks the option, because I think right now a lot of folks don't have that option. Related to that also, I am hoping that with the um, investments being made, especially at the park and ride, uh, that we see um, some major investments into bike lockers and things like that so that folks can, especially with the explosion of electric bikes, uh, we're seeing a lot of folks are using that as a way to commute a little bit further. And uh, I think that could be a great way to open up access um, at the, um, at, at the um, for with the with the bus rapid transit, so I'm hoping Metro will be hard, taking a hard look at that. I'm hoping Sound Transit will take a hard look at the lockers because that's their project. Um, and I really do appreciate unless there's, there's any other questions. Yeah, Councilor Marshall. Yeah, I wanted to thank the mayor for bringing up the former route in North Kenmore. It went up 68th and then back down 61st, looping around up there. It serves a a lot of uh, communities, and I would just strongly advocate for sometimes somewhere reinstituting that if possible. Thanks, Councilmember Shubnik. Yeah, I concur with my fellow council members about um, the lost route there. Um, I did also want to make an, yet another pitch. I know I've pitched this before, <laughs> um, but for our downtown uh, route, the only bus that now is one seat to downtown isn't really intended to go downtown. It's First Hill 322. And it makes one stop downtown. During rush hour, it's not even close to full. Um, so I wonder if there's a way to add one more stop. Because <laughs> right now, southbound, it stops uh, at the south end of downtown and northbound, it's at the north end at university. Um, and if there were one more in both directions, um, you know, I think you'd fill up a bus and you'd make a lot of people happy. De uh, Mayor? I'm just going to back up Council Member Shrednick's statement. I've been quiet about this. It's not that I'm not passionate about it. I trust that each of our council members have spoken clearly and eloquently about our need for one seat to downtown Seattle. It is, as an environmentalist, as someone who truly cares about the environment, it's hard for me to take the bus. And I live a five minute walk to 61st where we've saved and created you know, a special transit station. So it's incredibly important that we get this back. And I don't know what it's gonna take, how our community is going to be able to make a difference and bring it forward. We're opening up for public listening sessions, but are we going to be heard? We need to be heard here. We want, I want my kids riding the bus downtown. I want, I want to get on the bus and make it really easy to get to Husky game every time. I, it's, it's so important and it's something I grew up with. I grew up in Kenmore. I always had a bus route all the way downtown. So, I know we're doing great work. It's important work. We got a short stick here and we're gonna just 
<laughs> always bring it up when you come. So I, I just wanted to reiterate how important it is to our community that we get that route back. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, well, I'm not seeing anything else. I wanna thank all of you for taking the time tonight to uh, come and make this presentation. Always informative, great to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We are hearing you, thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. Here at Metro too. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, next on the agenda is something that's always a little exciting, new staff introductions. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, we have a couple new employees that have joined our team, and I'd like to turn over to John Vicente, our City Engineer, and Samantha Loyuk, our Development Services Director, to introduce them. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council. It's my pleasure to introduce Amber Clifton. She is our new administrative specialist in the engineering department. If you will recall, uh, Janet Quinn served as our admin specialist for a few years, and she in uh, August left me to go work for Stephanie as the ARPA management analyst. Uh, and so Amber, we brought Amber in uh, in October. Uh, she comes to us from uh, the Muckleteal School District, where she was an administrative uh, admin there, but she also spent several years at the uh, Edmonds uh, Municipal Court as a clerk. So uh, we're very pleased to have Amber with us, and if there's anything you'd like to say. Good evening, Council. Hi. Um, yeah, I spent 15 years at Edmonds Municipal Court as the supervisor, and so this is a big shift for me to be working in engineering. Janet's shoes are not easy to feel, fill. She's amazing, but um, I live in Kenmore. I grew up in this area, and I'm really excited to be able to serve the community that I live in, so thank you. Good evening, Council. So tonight I have with me Riley Rossbotham, and he is our new planner and development services department. He filled um, the planner position that I left when I became development services director. Um, Riley has great experience both in the private sector and the public sector. And Riley, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm coming here. I before here, I worked for a company called Barghausen Consulting Engineers doing um, planning on the, on the private side, so kind of on the other side. And then before that, I was doing development review planning with uh, Island County, Washington, so it would be in Camino Islands. Um, and then before that, I was with the city of Boulder in uh, Colorado, so a couple different states, a couple different jurisdictions. Um, but I'm really excited to be, to be here. I feel like I have really good support uh, taking over the position from Sam. So um, yeah, I really appreciate you all having me. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have you here. Thank you so much. And we look forward to everything you're gonna to bring to the city. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is public comments. We welcome our community members to the council's meeting in this forum. The council does not engage or dialogue with the public. The primary role of the council is to listen. We will hear from our on-site guests first, followed by our virtual guests. If you're online, please use the raise hand feature now if you wish to speak. All guests must address their comments to the mayor and city council. The clerk will acknowledge your, your request and call your name when it's your turn. Your time will start when we can confirm that we can hear you. Please state your name and city of residence for the record and keep your comments to the allotted time. We will not split your time with others or reset your time except by express approval of the presiding officer. Screen sharing is not allowed. You can submit materials to the council or clerk in advance. Please do not comment about pending development projects in which the council will make future decisions as those are quasi-judicial matters and council members must limit their communications about such matters. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you for taking the time to express your comments. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We currently have nine speakers signed up for on-site public comment and we'll take them in this order, starting with John Culver, followed by Patrick O'Brien, Jim Myers, and Elizabeth Mooney. Good evening, Council. John Culver, Ken Moore. A uh, few things to cover tonight. I want to start with some congratulations and well done to Tracy Bonashinsky. Uh, and also want to support the Swamp Creek 
I've seen the new map. I'm very excited. Do it. It seems like a slam dunk. Only thing at all, we should also pause any additional development there until we work out what exactly we want that to look like, but slam dunk, get it done. Sort of building on that piece number two, it strikes me as interesting that there seemed to be so much consensus developed around that, but it took a 6-1 vote and a minority report to get there. And I guess building on that, I would say we need to give the Planning Commission a little more tools in the tool belt. Um, having such a granular kind of microscopic focus to dive into issues, important, we need that, we need that detail. But if they're unable to sort of look holistically at how this all sort of fits together, we wind up with situations like this where you have to take a super zoomed in and use some you know, somewhat wonky, wonky procedures to arrive on some consensus that everybody seems kind of wild about. So something to consider. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, funding on the cap. The first meeting we had, I was very encouraged. I heard a lot of excitement, if a little hesitation around some sticker shock, sticker prices, whatever you want to call it. Um, it seems to me though, like that it, it drifted significantly. It seemed like the next meeting was talking about scaling that back drastically, which was very concerning. Um, then we got some assurances, no, no, don't worry. We're still, we're still funding things. Things take time. We're gonna go find grants, et cetera. Uh, and I have some heartburn about that. Um, this is a priority to the city, which means funding things. It means allocating budgets to it. If it's a tentative thing and we gotta go get it and we gotta find other people to get it, um, that's not guaranteed. That's not a commitment. That's a, that's a prospect, it's a promising prospect. Um, but we gotta do better on that. I will have more to say on that in the future, but I will see my time. Thank you. Pat O'Brien, City of Kenmore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, talk to item N and item Q on your agenda tonight. They have to do with the continuation of the Cascade Law Group uh, in more uh, representation or lack thereof for the city of Kenmore, city staff and the city manager. We demand the removal of the asphalt plant and that's pretty clear. And that's been uh, pointed out by thousands of citizens and nuisance complaints. We would like to see our law firm, Inslee Best represent us in a tort case against the asphalt plant and the city, as city council members, you should be all on board with that. It is a rapid remedy in, in response to nuisance uh, demands of the citizens. You don't have to prove a thing. You just have to prove there's a nuisance. It's money well spent. It's the quick and reliable remedy to ending what's going on at the asphalt plant. They were operating yesterday. You are gonna get pictures and video tomorrow of what I took. Uh, so the nuisance claim is valid. It's a way to do it. It's a way to do it inexpensively. The, the asphalt can't, can't, plant can't complain that you took that action. Uh, you need to encourage Rob Carlinzi and his staff to get on board with that and, and, and focus on developing that nuisance complaint brought by the city. And then we will know that your whole climate action plan is valid because that's the number one complaint of our health and the environmental health in the city. And anything else you do at Swamp Creek or anything else is nice, but it does not address that issue. And you need to, before you all lead, leave office or get reelected, that has to be fixed. You will never have a vibrant downtown with that there. And you have another remedy. Between the time that their supposed grandfather clause ends and when they apply for and get or not get a new operations permit, you can rezone that area and not have it have anything to do with industrial. That is waterfront. Um, it can be protected. There's a number of designations you can put on it. It does not have to be industrial. And now, since this permit 
has vanished. It's gone. It was an invalid permit to start with. Now it's really gone. Rezone it and say, I'm sorry, you don't have a use that can comport with what we have planned for our city. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Jim Myers. I'm a resident of Kenmore. You've heard me speak before. I'm here to speak in, in the support of the preservation and ideally restoration of, of the Swamp Creek for fish and, and for the fish and wild, wildlife that live in the basin and for the enjoyment of the, of the people of Kenmore and the surrounding cities. Swamp Creek is Kenmore's premier stream. And um, as we all know, it, it is in trouble. And what this stream needs is a healthy watershed with adequate buffers and not allowances for ever more encroachments um, to that stream. As a, as a salmon stream, it, it, it has been to some extent, still, still is, and hopefully will again be a salmon stream. The, the recommendations are actually for 200 foot buffers not being greedy, I, I saw that there were 150 foot buffers on, on, on the map, but we, um, we need buffers that, prov that provide ecological, ecological function, not a planted strip, not a tree bark median. We need, we need things that actually function. Um, so uh, I ask you to, con to consider the option and the map that, it, that have been put forward and to ask, um, or I guess to find ways to um, see and to, and to test, is this an adequate buffer? It's, um, it, it, it looks like we're giving a lot to the creek, but um, would be nice to have some professional validation of, of, that, of that buffer. Taking time to assess these, these things doesn't really risk much. You can always move, move forward. Um, depending on what the answer is. But if you put development in, you can be sure it's probably not gonna come out in our lifetime. So on, 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 on the risk return curve, um, patients always err to the side of, always err to the side of conservation. And it's perhaps somewhat ironic that, um, or it's either ironic or it's apropos that an award was given to, to uh, Swamp Creek Park. Um, so I guess you'll decide whether whether it's one one or one or the other, and to think about what the future residents of, of Kenmore will will want from from their in, in environment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Mooney. Um, I want to support what Jim Myers just said, that you err to the side of conservation in all your decisions from now on out. Um, I want to thank Tracy Bonazinski and Eric and uh, Stacy Admin and Snow King Watershed Council. Um, I want to support your uh, supporting the minority report and the TOD and um, and then I want to talk to you about our asphalt dilemma in Kenmore on the Burke Gilman Trail, on our shoreline. Um, and can we do a citizen's initiative? Can we say it's a nuisance? How many people do you think are in Kenmore and Lake Forest Park, et cetera, the bikers <coughs> that would agree that it's disgusting, it's dangerous? And now Cadman, or, you know, they're, they're, their Cal Portland's lessees, um, they've appealed. I guess you all know that. I hope you all know that. Um, so our nonprofit has been working on this perk, People for Environmentally Responsible Kenmore. And we're hoping that you'll put out a public health notice, like dear Kenmore residents, it's been brought to the city's attention by resident volunteer efforts, as well as the work of our legislators like Jerry Paulette. Um, that the existing asphalt plant in Kenmore may pose a health hazard. It has may in there. And then what's your vision for Kenmore's waterfront? Asphalt emissions or maybe a public park 
with a return of nature, bird habitat, salmon runs restored. It's your chance. And then things that the city of Kenmore could do, maybe with nonprofits, um, a symptom survey, advertising on the billboards right next to Cadman um, to educate the public about air quality health hazards and let them know Cadman just appealed this. They're not, are they gonna put a stay on the permit so that the 90 days after October 26th, there isn't going to be an emissions test like Puget Sound Clean Air Agency said they should do? Um, what about pursuing alternative uses of that Cadman Cal Portland site? Um, possible actions. All the governors shut down the plant during hazardous air quality days. He let us down. Inform residents in Burke Gilman um, of potential health hazards. Provide signage for reporting from Burke Gilman Trail. Test the emissions from the asphalt plant. Conduct a state of Kenmore's environment since incorporation. And by the way, if I thank you very much for hiring Cascade keep them on the payroll, but let's, let's do maybe what Patrick and uh, accuse them of a nuisance. Orley Johnson, followed by Eric Admin, Peter Lance, Joan Hardy, and Tracy Bonashinsky. Good evening. Um, hopefully mine's very short. Uh, I just sort of wanted to talk a bit about Swamp Creek that comes out of Lake Stickney or Stickney Lake, eight and a half miles to the slough and then about a mile down to the river. It about three miles or so it goes into a swamp. And maybe that's why they called it Swamp Creek, where it meanders and people constantly want to get rid of that swamp. But the swamp, and a lot of it has already been gotten rid of. The swamp is credibly important to salmon because it gives them a place to get out of the current. It provides food for them. And it's, it's a very valuable resource. Now I mentioned salmon. And in 1933, the University of Washington put in a fish trap. I, I suppose you know that, it's kind of famous. Donaldson wrote a paper Lauren Donaldson, Doc Donaldson. If you're in fisheries and you got your degrees there, you know who he is. <clears throat> and they counted the fish, the kokanee that came up. And because they counted them, Swamp Creek had more kokanee than anywhere else in the world. Now that's kind of a joke if you think about British Columbia, but nonetheless, officially they did. And they documented the fish, they documented their behavior and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And they continued on and on. Jeff Jensen has talked a little bit about this. Um, so officially there's, there's a 200 foot buffer, but I'm really happy that you're gonna put in a hundred foot. That's great. Uh, 500 feet is what actually salmon need because they actually sometimes spawn underneath of rhododendrons and their babies that hatch out actually move with all the water that comes down, move underground to get into the river. So that 500 foot is a, is a real thing, but it's not a practical thing for, for cities. Um, oh, and I should also mention there historically were three kokanee runs in Washington, Lake Sammamish. A summer run that went way to the end of Lake Sammamish a middle run in the fall that was the most popular one in terms of where the fish went all through Lake Washington and whatnot. Um, and then lastly, the winter run, which is what we had, but along with the fall run. And again, these were the only salmonids in Lake Washington. So it's a really big deal. And I, I thank you all for that 100 foot buff buffer and, and getting things cleaned up and doing a good job. Thank you, and let's hope it actually works. Um, I believe he gave his name. I didn't no. hear it at the beginning, sorry. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Johnson, could you just give us your name and, and city of residence for the record? Oh, more than w. Thank you.
Good evening, I'm Eric Admin, and I live in Kenmore and I have some comments to offer uh, regarding the business agenda item B, the transit development amendments. Um, before I offer those comments, I did wanna thank all the council members for all the time that you put in on our behalf and also thank the staff for the hard work that you do and also thank the, all the consider, concerned citizens who've uh, spoken up this evening. So, um, and in particular, I wanna recognize Tracy Banaszynski, who's awesome and has been a, a great uh, source of inspiration and, and does a lot of great volunteer work. So I'm also the president of the Snoking Watershed Council and we have worked for many years for protection and restoration of Swamp Creek. Swamp Creek uh, has a lot of issues associated with development, most of which originate outside of Kenmore, but there are some things that we can do about the part which is within Kenmore. Uh, I really appreciate the council and the staff's willingness to support restoration efforts on Swamp Creek. Kenmore has supported this in the past and has supported our work in the past. And uh, I also appreciate that the process of updating the transit-oriented development regulations has taken a long time, and it's one that you'd like to be able to approve and move forward on. The section of Swamp Creek that we're talking about in the transit-oriented development zone is about approximately 1,000 feet of Swamp Creek. In that area, currently, it is mostly pavement right up to the bank of the creek, and that's both on the west side by the bowling alley and on the east side where there's apartments. There's also some residential properties with lawns up to the creek that will probably be redeveloped into higher density properties. Um, I support the staff recommendation in the uh, November 23rd staff memo for assessment of restoration potential along Swamp Creek and allocating future funding to purchase for restoration easements. I also support option two in the memo regarding the TOD regulations to carve out a geographic area along Swamp Creek in the uh, TOD area and bring back an ordinance to update the TOD regulations for that carve out area. Uh, I was gonna request that uh, we consider a, a compromise between what's for the creek at that site, which would be a three or 500 foot buffer with floodplain reconnection with what is realistic to implement and include those updated requirements for specific properties in the TOD along Swamp Creek when it's adopted in January or February. However, I did see a last minute agenda item addition, which shows the area with a 150 foot buffer. So I don't know if that's currently what's actually being proposed or if that was just put for discussion purposes, but I think that that is a great starting point for us to aspire to. So again, thank you for um, working with us to support the restoration of Swamp Creek. Peter Lance, followed by Joan Hardy and Tracy Bonashinsky. If Peter Lance is not here, Joan Hardy. Hi, I'm Joan Hardy, live in Kenmore. And first, I'd like to thank you all for uh, supporting that bus, one-stop bus to go downtown. That was very important when I was working. I'm a retired toxicologist from the Department of Health, currently on the board of directors for Lake Advocates. And I'm here to um, talk about just two unrelated items. And the first is there's a grant opportunity with the King County Waterworks um, a grant program to submit a for cities or nonprofits to submit a grant to um, work on water quality issues ranging from $10,000 to over $100,000. I've submitted two uh, and received uh, money to work with King uh, UW Bothell uh, students on outreach and education on water quality topics. And a second one using drones to monitor harmful algal blooms in three North King County lakes. So just a couple things. So if um, wondering if you're interested, that, so that would be the council. Two, I'd be happy to work with someone and I'd like to know who that would be. And third, what the topic would be. So if um, Rob, maybe you could let me know if you're interested and if who I could work with on a volunteer basis, I would be happy to. On an unrelated item, uh, there was a fire at Heron's Wood um, Low Income Housing, just on 182nd. I know someone through the uh, service sector who lived there. There were 51 apartments there. And these people have been uh, displaced and are living right now in um, various 
Holiday Inn, I think, uh, it, or I'm not even quite sure in residences. And apparently the insurance for paying for these people is up at the end of November. So these are low income people who don't have a lot of reserve funding for emergencies. And they're having, from what I hear, trouble finding um, housing. I know that people have tried uh, getting in touch with the ARC, um, which I've heard of, and some other agencies and just not getting any response. And this one person that um, uh, discussed this with me was just distraught and, and had uh, no, thing, um, no idea of what to do. So I don't know what the responsibility is at the city level or at the council level, but I think we should care somehow at least to assist our uh, low income, all of our citizens and uh, ensure that they have housing and are able to move. So wanted to bring that up, thanks. Good evening, Tracy Banashinsky, Kenmore. Uh, thank you so much, Council and City of Kenmore for the recognition of Snow King Watershed Council's Swamp Creek Habitat Restoration Project tonight. It's a real an honor to receive that recognition. The project means a lot to me and I'm glad that people in the city are taking note. Um, I couldn't leave tonight without giving my own thanks and gratitude to so many people who have been a part of this project. Many of them are not in the room today, but I have to say their names because they are in my heart. So here I go. My gratitude um, goes to project co-founders, Deputy Mayor Melanie O'Kane and Kenmore resident Linda Phillips for the vision and heart it took to manifest this project, to the city of Kenmore for permission to work on city land, the city manager, Rob Carlinzi, and uh, city staff, Stephanie Brown, Quinn Prophet, Jennifer Gordon, Justin L, and Rita Moreno for their behind the scenes support. And to Snow King Watershed Council, this project's nonprofit heart and home, and especially to Eric Admin and Jeremy Jones for their mentorship. I also have to express my gratitude to my mother, Joanne Bonashinsky, and my kiddo, Henry Fergozzi, who were with me earlier when I received the recognition. Um, they have either been out there digging in the dirt with me or at home together so that I could be out clipping and digging so I couldn't do this without them. I kind of know a little bit what like the people who are receiving Academy Awards must feel like because they want to thank everyone they love. That's what I want to do right now. Um, if not for the individuals of all ages who have volunteered their time, we would not have built what we have over these past three years, a place for community and belonging. We are embraced just as we are, where we learn and grow together where we are healing ourselves as much as we are healing the land. For showing up regularly during all our significant parts of our third year together, I wanna to express my gratitude to community members, Stacy Admin, Dan Ellison, Sally Carazan, Nancy Hansen, David Harris, Eduard, Mariana, Natasha, and Anushka LaSalle, Megan Lemieux, Anurag and Avi Mishra, Obala and Anjali Reddy, and Jennifer Wing. Council member Deborah Shrebnik, it was a pleasure to see you out when you could come. Um, we're all so needed in this work and everyone who has ever volunteered, whether I've called them out here or not, is permanently etched in my heart. And that goes for almost every one of you who's been on, who is on the dais right now. And if you haven't been there, I know why, and I know that you care about this too. So the recognition of this project today is for all of us who have participated in any way over the past three years. Without us, I could do little. With us, so much is possible. For my part, thank you so very much for allowing me to do this work in our community. And here's to another three years. Mayor, I have no additional speakers signed up for on-site. Can we move on to virtual? If you are joining us virtually, we'd like to give public comment at this time, please use the raise hand function. At this time, I have four individuals signed up for public comment and we'll take them in this order. Dakota Rash, followed by David Morton, Stacey Valenzuela and Victoria Grayland. Dakota, whenever you're ready. Thank you, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Thank you, Dakota Rash Lake Forest Park. Um, thank you all for the time tonight. So first, please fully fund the cap. It's literally the top budgeting priority. So please allocate it some money. Um, next, I want to comment on something that was a very t um, hot topic last week, um, the topic of best available science. So despite not actually being a card carrying scientist, this is a topic I've had a lot of uh, opportunities to work with. Um, and all too often, I think 
best available science is kind of offered as an assurance, like, oh, don't worry, we're following best available science. The environment will be fine. I have two issues with this. First, science is constantly evolving. As an example, even the American Fisheries Society acknowledges that best available science has an expanded well from the species specific level to the ecosystem scale level, meaning we may be ignoring the true critical nature of things like ecosystem damage thresholds and wildlife connectivity. But that's kind of taking fault with science. And that's the lesser of the two concerns in my mind, because honestly, if we perfectly followed higher level science recommendations, we would be in a much better situation with the natural world. So the bigger issue I think is the mischaracterization of pure science. Best available science is a data set. It's analysis, it's testing and research. How this is then transmuted through the political process and policies is what impacts what actually happens in the real world. So Council Member O'Kane, you hit the nail on the head. Way too often we use best available science when it's required like something in the Growth Management Act or even the Endangered Species Act in that we go in asking the wrong question. How can we develop and not destroy a stream? Because I mean, we're for sure gonna develop, but I guess as an afterthought, how do we check the boxes to make sure we aren't 100% eliminating the environment? This is acknowledged in wetlands in Washington state, the guides developed by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Ecology. In those guides, those agencies outline that the purpose of those guides is to facilitate inclusion of best available science when adopting development regulations to designate and protect critical areas. So you hear the assumption baked in there, you are developing. Those are the standards that are then referenced and baked into city code and look at the natural world. It's not working. What we need is consideration of the environment at the top level. Ask instead of how do we develop and then not 100% destroy a stream, how do we restore a river that is critical to the environment and ecosystems around it and also house people? That's the only way we are going to get to a sustainable place on this planet. So please give Swamp Creek, Creek room. I like the recommendation that's out there, but my one issue is that under the interim TOD regulations, there isn't enough of a pause. Development could still happen. So pr consider putting an absolute pause in that carve out while you study what's necessary to restore the river. Thank you. David Morton, go ahead. Good evening, council members. I'm David Morton. I live near Redmond. CADMAN has appealed PSEAA's order of approval number 11861. Here are some possible reasons for CADMAN's appeal. For determining compliance with an emission standard, PSCAA is authorized to order a plant the plant's owner or operator to test and report emissions to PSCAA, who can require that the testing recur at specific intervals. In condition 22 of the order of approval, PSCAA requires that every three years, CADMAN will test its emissions of particulate matter, VOCs, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides. PSCAA acknowledges that similar facilities have usually been required to test on a five-year basis. However, the precedent set by other permits is not the only consideration in determining testing frequency. There has been very little emissions testing performed at the 50-year-old Cadman Kenmore facility. The facility's compliance record and history of odor complaints in the community give adequate reason for the increased testing frequency every three years. Cadman's request for less frequent testing every five years is opposed by the many commenters that requested more frequent testing every 18 months. Cadman is also concerned that more frequent testing means unnecessary operation and production at the plant. PSCAA suggested that Cadman base the timing of emissions testing on its operational schedule. PSCAA encourages Cadman to perform testing when it expects high demand for its product and before the three-year deadline. With careful coordination of testing with production schedules, Cadman can minimize the production of unnecessary asphalt concrete. PSCAA is unaware of any asphalt plant that operated simply to complete an air emission performance test and was unable to sell the resulting product. Also, 
PSCAA determined that storage of cutback asphalt in the asphalt cement storage tanks would invalidate the assumptions and emission factors that were used in calculating and reviewing the project emissions because the storage of cutback asphalt was not included in CADMAN's application and its VOC or toxic air pollution emissions estimates, PSCAA will not permit and prohibits the storage of cutback asphalt in these tanks. PSCAA's on-site compliance records clearly show that CADMAN should be concerned about a deepening investigation into CADMAN's use of cutback asphalt in Kenmore. The investigation is not over. Thank you. Stacey Valenzuela. Stacey Valenzuela, Ken Mark, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Thank you. As we finalize the year, I'm reminded that the three resident surveys from 2019, the top request of our residents is still being ignored, or is it? Natural parks and trails. The city has been cementing parks. I hope you take this opportunity to support restorations to protect and preserve Swamp Creek and our floodplain by approving the TOD minority report changes to the buffer zone. It is so important. And we need the money for the CAP plan as well. Kenmore can do so much better with transparency and enforcement, as well as directing staff to follow city ordinances adopted by city council that represent the will of the people, our residents and businesses, not outside developers. I watched the planning commission spend hours developing low 50% AMI and extremely low 30% below affordable housing and missing middle thoughtful policy, only to be so disappointed last week when statements staff brought developers who want the 70 and 80% um, affordable housing. Those people can afford rent. They're earning 70 to $85,000. Of course, the developers want to make bigger profits. Of course, these developers want high contingencies like tax exemption for 12 years with little effort. But that's not the priority. The priority and the goal is what Kenmore needs and what the majority of residents support. All of King County desperately needs housing for singles and families working, earning 50,000 and below. And those disabled veterans and seniors earning 20 to 30,000 or below. Can you imagine yourself attempting to pay rent on that income level? The inflation and rent increases and pandemic continuing? We desperately need to keep people housed and food available. We need to increase density, but protect quality of life for all living things. We also know that our air quality, environment, climate, wetlands, salmon, hair and rookery, and ecosystems still continue to be threatened. In these areas, I know the city can do a lot better to keep Kenmore a treasure where we love to live. But what will your actions show us? Thank you. Victoria Grayland. Can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Great, thank you. I agree with uh, most of the uh, citizen comments tonight. They're very good. Uh, so Cadman filed a countersuit. Big surprise. I'd like to know what Cascadia's strategy is. I know what our strategy is, is to wait and see. Because <laughs> the first hearing is what, six months away? So we have plenty of time to work on this. <clears throat> um, and a year ago, I asked the uh, council member Baker for an epidemiological study for Kenmore. I have not had any updates on that. I'd like to find out where that's going. I also want to congratulate and commend uh, Planning Commissioner Tracy Banachensky for her minority report. And I have to bring race into this because the city itself has passed a DEI statement. But uh, it's very rare for a white official to stand up for nature. You expect it of native officials. 
but it's very unexpected from a white official. And it took a lot of bravery. And I think it's resounding within the community. So thank you again, Tracy. Do you honestly think developers will want to stay, to develop in downtown Kenmore as long as an asphalt plant keeps spewing its pollution on us all? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good night. Mayor, I have no additional hands raised at this time. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second, council member file. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda stands approved. Uh, next up, we have the business agenda. First item on the business agenda, regional crisis response agency interlocal agreement, the incorporation of the agency as a nonprofit corporation under RCW 24.06 um, and authorize the city manager to execute the interlocal agreement and articles of incorporation presented by assistant city manager, Stephanie Lukash, police chief, Brandon Moen, uh, North Sound Radar Program Manager, Brooke Butner, and uh, Karen Reed Consultant, uh, Consulting Consultant, Karen Reed. And I also think Chief Moen is on the line, or he was. Thank you. He's here. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of the council. Happy to have Karen, Brooke, and we'll get Chief Moen with us here in a moment to bring back to you the Regional Crisis Response Agency Interlocal Agreement and Articles of Incorporation that we discussed back in September. So I have a few slides that we'll go through and we'll give time for questions. And this is a, a we're asking for action tonight on those items. So as you recall, we have been partnering on the Re response awareness de-escalation and referral, otherwise known as radar program with the cities of Bothell, Kirkland, Lake Forest Park and Shoreline for several years now. And this program pairs mental health professionals with our police on co-response. And what we're, we know is that we need to expand those services. Currently the services are provided five days a week and we're looking to expand to seven days a week. And as we did this work, we brought Karen Reed on board as a consultant and the five cities have been working on this for more than a year. The plan now is to create a new entity called the Regional Crisis Response Program, expand a seven day a week coverage and to create a nonprofit and articles of incorporation to house the program. And the funding for this program was actually approved in your budget last week that you adopted. And all the other councils have, of those four cities have adopted these actions previously. So we're the last one to go tonight. As you recall, back in September, we proposed a draft interlocal agreement and articles of incorporation. And both this council and all the other councils provided really great feedback to the team and we heard you. So several changes are made. I won't go through all of these. They were in your agenda packet, but the first few I wanna bring your attention to. So we heard you loud and clear on the name and the new name is Regional Crisis Response or RACER is what we're calling it. We think that's a lot better than the previous name. In response to this council's concerns about funding this program, we did reduce the term from what was originally proposed to be six years to four years. And there's provision to relook at the funding structure before the next biennial budget cycle. So in two years in the summer to look at what we've learned, to look at data from the program and then relook at how we fund it. And so that's a conversation we've committed to have. So I think those are items I want to particularly bring to your attention. I thought those would be of interest as well as some of the other things, an organizational chart, and there's a lot more clear language and a lot of nuance that was handled and clarified in the final draft that you have received. 
And then you'll know that a couple of things, a couple of exciting things have happened. One, we applied for the Association of Washington Cities grant program. And I want to thank Garrett Oppenheim from our team who took the lead on applying for that. And we were successful. So our coalition is receiving $70,500 in those funds from this AWC. So we're really grateful for that. And then in addition to that, what's not even on the slide is the mid funding did come through when King County adopted its budget and it was adopted at the current level plus inflation. So between those two things actually were, we're receiving additional funds than we anticipated and that were projected in the numbers that you've seen. So I ran the numbers just while we were talking, Brooke was messaging me earlier and our contribution is Kenmore will be $148,887 next year and 138524 in 2024. So we've just saved ourselves a little bit of money. And I want you to know this coalition is committed to continuing to pursue grant funding opportunities, just like the AWC that came up. And I know we have a position that's in our budget next year. We're hoping to um, come back in the beginning of the year. That's one of the things that person would be helping with. So we have an action here for you tonight. I did want to see if you had any questions for Chief Moen, Karen, or Brooke, or myself before we proceed. Questions? I am not seeing any questions. Um, Deputy Mayor? I was waiting for what you were going to say next. <laughs> All right. Well, the chair would entertain a motion. Um, to approve the regional crisis response agency and our local agreement, the incorporation of the agency as a nonprofit corporation under RCW 24.06 uh, and authorize the city manager to execute the interlocal agreement and articles of incorporation present, um, yeah, and articles of incorporation. So moved. So moved. Second, any council member file. All right, everybody got excited about that. Um, we have a motion, a second, any discussion? Council member Shrebnik. Yeah, I'm, um... I love this program <laughs> and it's certainly as a pilot program has shown um, some preliminary success and you know ex not only acceptability but desirability from the perspective of the community and the stakeholders and the police. Um, so I think it's certainly justified to talk about expanding it. Um, and. Uh, you know, expanding it to seven days a week, um, as proposed, I, I personally feel that it should be not only expanded to seven days a week, but countywide. Um, but I don't feel like this should be on the backs of cities. I've said this before. The pilot was supported by the county mid funding mental illness drug dependency um, levy. And the count and I believe the county level is where this program should sit. I don't feel that cities are the experts in this, um, nor are we best positioned financially to support it. Um, I would, I, I believe that it should be at the county level between the sheriff and the behavioral health division. I also think that by not expanding this countywide, uh, this is an equity issue where richer North End cities like ourselves, uh, we're taking care of our own. And, um, this this could be uh, more effectively done as a region. Um, I just don't think this is the right way to go. I also don't agree with developing a separate nonprofit. I understand that it's been, again, challenging to do this as a set of cities, which is part of the reason that I don't believe that this is the right approach. Uh, but developing a separate nonprofit that's disconnected from the existing service and law enforcement system I don't feel is the right way to go. And I also feel that a separate nonprofit, just like any other organization is gonna take money out of the system to operate, um, which I also don't feel is the right approach. Um, and I, I, hate, I hate to be saying this because I like this program and I wanna see it expanded, but I'm actually gonna to have to vote no on these um, for the reasons that I've said. Any further discussion? Council Member File. 
Thank you. I couldn't be more delighted. We're moving, um, moving ahead. It's great to see that we have surrounding partners who are very engaged uh, and see the importance of this topic, this issue. Um, I can remember seeing the first hint of funding come out and sending a, an email off probably within seconds of reading the, the pop-up email on my inbox and um, off to, to our city manager, Rob. And I had a, a quick response and we had Chief Moen right in there and then you were new with us and you jumped right on in. And it seemed like regionally um, from our north and, and, and east side that we had an amazing amount of quick to action support on this uh, topic because we know what the need is, is, is so incredibly, um, we, we have such an incredible need in our communities that's not being met on the North End any side at all, um, especially on the North End. Um, so I am very, uh, very proud of all of our partners who have chased down the extra funding and uh, to our staff. And uh, I look forward to watching more what you guys can do and, and pull off. And I certainly hope one day that we can see a, a youth center uh, of some sort of teen uh, supportive crisis in our hair as well. I know that's a discussion that's been had on the east side um, of our partners. So thank you. Love the new name. I could be more delighted. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'd just like to say that I actually agree with both of my colleagues here. I think um, sometimes when the governments above us don't do things, we have to step up as cities. I'm hoping at some point that we'll be able to hand this off to the county. As I agree with Councilmember Shredwick, I think they are better equipped in the long run uh, with this. But I do appreciate all the staff work that's gone into this. I'm excited at the partnerships that we've built around this, and I'm looking forward to uh, this becoming a reality. Would the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to approve the Regional Crisis Response Agency Interlocal Agreement, the incorporation of the agency as a nonprofit nonprofit corporation under RCW 24.06 and authorize the city manager to execute the interlocal agreement and articles of incorporation, seconded by Council Member File. Council Member Baker. Aye. Council Member File. Yes. Deputy Mayor O'Kane. Yes. Council Member Shrebnik. No. Council Member Kugler? Yes. Council Member Marshall? Yes. Mayor Herbig? Yes. With six yeses and one no, the motion passes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, unless there's any objection, I would propose that we take a five minute break. All right, five minute break.
Members of the Council will come back to order. Next on the agenda, Planning Commission's recommendation on transit-oriented development amendments presented by Community Development Director Debbie Bent and Principal Planner Lori Anderson. Good evening, Mayor Herbig and members of the City Council. Uh, last week, you heard from the Planning Commission. Uh, they presented their recommendations on the TOD amendments, some of which, uh, some of those standards were extended uh, west to downtown. Um, and tonight is your opportunity to have discussion about their recommendations and, and with luck to give uh, direction to staff so that we could prepare an ordinance to bring back to you at the beginning of the year. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, providing information on the topic that we heard the most about <laughs> uh, last week, which was the minority uh, opinion and the interest in ongoing protection for Swamp Creek and the Swamp Creek Corridor. Uh, staff has met and talked about that uh, and, and strategized about land use, the ability of land use controls like zoning to result in the outcome that seemed uh, desirable. And we came to the conclusion that there may be another approach that the council could consider. And we sent out a memo describing that, but I wanna go into a little bit more detail uh, tonight. So to advance the TOD amendments while still uh, focusing on uh, swamp, the health of Swamp Creek, uh, staff is recommending a Swamp Creek Corridor Assessment, a channel restoration assessment, as we've called it. That would look at Swamp Creek through the whole city of Kenmore and identify scientifically uh, the areas where there is the most opportunity for restoration with the greatest ecological benefit. Uh, based on that assessment, staff would prioritize uh, stream segments uh, to bring back to council and identify new projects that could be added to the capital facilities plan uh, to tackle those efforts. Uh, then using that priority list as a guide and in keeping with the updated capital facilities plan, uh, the city would consider allocating funding to purchase and secure restoration easements to be used in the event a property redeveloped. In other words, the city would not be purchasing property, but would be negotiating with a property owner to purchase an easement over that property so that at the time of redevelopment or new development in some cases, the city would pay a sum of money to the property owner, giving the city the right to expand the Swamp Creek buffer or take other shoreline restoration actions. Potential funding sources could include capital restricted revenues and grants. So this is a project that would be um, going on. And in the meantime, the question comes, what do we do with the TOD amendments? Um, one approach would be to direct staff to prepare an ordinance based on the planning commission recommendation with other uh, amendments that you're interested in. The other approach would be to carve out uh, an area from the TOD that would continue under the interim regulations, under the existing interim regulations, um, while the rest of the TOD amendments were brought forward as part of an ordinance. As, as we discussed uh, the carve out, the concept of having the city council uh, talk about potential options for the carve out uh, would come about at the time the assessment had been done so that if this was a priority corridor, we could offer um, incentives to achieve the goals of this part of the corridor. And then we would also need to extend the interim regulations for as long as it took to get to a resolution of these issues. As part of the discussion, we uh, developed a map showing potential properties that we thought might be appropriate for you to consider as part of the carve out. And I'm gonna ask, here it is, here's the map. It was in your packet uh, today. And I wanna describe what it is because I think there's some confusion over what this is. This is not changing the critical area buffers 
uh, for the Swamp Creek uh, area. Currently, uh, the buffers along Swamp Creek in this area, which is uh, targeted either for uh, residential or on the east side of the creek or for commercial on the west side of the creek, uh, are about 60 feet. I have the exact numbers, but 60 feet is the standard. What staff is proposing is that we take a larger buffer, which is what would apply if this reach of Swamp Creek was considered a natural area. So an area that is not affected at all by development, but is pristine. Uh, and, and look at that to determine what properties we should consider for exempting from the TOD uh, amendments. So that is where the red line comes in. That is 150 feet, which is the standard buffer for a natural reach of Swamp Creek. And the proposal would be that properties that touched that 150 foot buffer area would be the ones that would be continuing under the current TOD interim regulations. So you can see the channel, it's hard to see here, but the black line is the uh, approximate area of the ordinary high watermark. Again, the red line is 150 feet from that ordinary high watermark. And then the parcels that are crosshatched in yellow are those that are touched by that 150 foot distance. So all the crosshatched cross parcels would be the ones that would be exempted uh, from the current TOD amendments and would become um, the carve out for future consideration. Uh, this parcel up at the north is a King County Housing Authority development. Uh, parking here on this parcel, this is the bowling alley. This is the new school, Montessori School. This is the grocery outlet, strip mall, the Starbucks, the bank. Um, uh, the Thai restaurant, and um, if we continue down Mr. T's trophies here, that's all on the west side of the creek. On the east side, this is an apartment complex. This is a uh, development um, that you have seen public testimony about. That, that project is actually vested and so we anticipate that it will continue as planned as a six story apartment project. These are condominiums and this is a vacant parcel um, that is next to this proposed apartment building. So again, what staff is recommending is because all of these parcels are touched by that potential natural buffer, they be used uh, to determine where the carve out should be. So that was what I wanted to present in terms of your comments last time about Swamp Creek and potential impacts to Swamp Creek. Uh, and so we are ready to hear your discussion and answer questions. Questions, uh, Deputy Mayor. I think first thing I just wanna say is thank you for coming back with this detailed plan this week based on our comments last week. I, I, when I saw it, this, I, I was personally pleased to see the creativity and thought that's gone into this. I also appreciate um, the natural buffer that you've mentioned, like what the 150 foot buffer that the natural creek could potentially have that you've used as a guide here. So I just, I first just want to give you a thank, thank you for coming back with this. It matched my personal vision of something that we could potentially do. Um, my question is, I, and I can say I lean towards a carve out, but the other option was to, do, the first option to do the assessment that's more general. Is there a benefit or risk to one or the other that you think we should be aware of as a council as we're making this decision? So the two actually went hand in hand. The assessment was what would be used to identify whether there should be um, mitigating um, efforts in this particular reach of Swamp Creek. So it was envisioned that the assessment would occur. In the meantime, this area would be uh, 
continuing under the existing interim regulations. And then depending on the outcome of the assessment, there might be some, uh, for example, um, incentives that could be offered or um, sort of a modified TOD um, set of amendments if warranted. Thank you. I really appreciate the clarification. Council Member File. Thank you. I, you know, I love this idea. I think this is a really um, healthy solution given the kind of feedback that was uh, shared. Uh, I'm also looking at the opportunity of protective easements uh, from existing property lines. Uh, I think that would be a, a good way to protect and preserve um, any encroachment. Also, we can work with uh, nearby neighbors so that if something's not going to be part of a carve out, we are still looking ahead to what we can do to grow a buffer uh, and a protective buffer with a protective easement. Um, and I, I think that would be a healthy thing to, to consider uh, for the future of this area, whether it's near Swamp Creek, the runoff, or uh, the Heron Rookery. Thank you. Councilmember Marshall. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, coming up with the assessment and Swamp Creek carve out plan. I think that's a, a great idea. And then uh, if it's not too early for discussion, um, I do want to express my concern for the height on the rest of the TOD. I think it's 80 feet. Is that right? 85 feet. 85, which is about 20 feet higher than the link developments here, I think, as you told us. Uh, about 10. 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Only 10. Um, but nevertheless, I still have concerns about the height. I think it's good in a sense that it's only on the north side of the highway, so it doesn't make a total canyon-like approach. I think we, we got to avoid a canyon approach like has happened to Lake City. So I'm not altogether upset about that, but I'm still concerned about it. But then uh, also I'm, I'm concerned about the 1.5 minimum on parking per unit was thinking about, or excuse me, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 minimum on parking per unit. I recall, you know, the kids being in daycare and just got to think of the many working families who need to drive their kids to daycare to get them there. Um, so I'm expressed concerns about that too. Thanks. Councilor Kugler. My comments are actually very similar to council member Marshall's. I um, really appreciate staff's recommendations to secure restoration easements and this, um, this uh, preliminary Swamp Creek buffer that you just proposed, I um, think is gr great. Um, I also was concerned about the 85 foot height only because um, from what you shared in our previous conversation, um, it sounded like developers didn't need it for more units. So if they don't need it for more units, I don't, I don't see why we would raise it from 65 feet. So, um, and I think council member Shrebnik had said the same last time. So I agree with um, her, her statements about that. And then also with the parking limits, I also have concern, like I, um, not in terms of like the 0.5 requirement, it's not that far off from 0.75. And I know many cities um, are moving towards no parking requirements, but my concern is from the city overall, like we need to take an incremental approach to that. We're not at the point where everyone is using public transportation um, and for it to be very convenient to get around. I think it's going to put pressure on what we have available. And I think we do need to think about adding parking time limits to more places, uh, probably. But I've, I feel like that we need to look at sort of overall. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify a couple points. I, first of all, I want to clarify that this is not a buffer. This is not a critical area buffer shown in red on the map. The current critical area buffer, which as I said is for example, 60 feet is the buffer that would be applied. There would be an easement put over it. If there was redevelopment, there would be um, uh, restoration required. So I, 
I think there's some confusion over what that is, and it's not an increased buffer. It is the area that would be protected uh, or not moved to the new uh, TOD amendments while this assessment was being done. The second point I wanted to tackle, <laughs> and I haven't done a good job with this, obviously, is the question of the 85 foot height versus the 65 foot height. So what I have been trying to express not effectively is that at a 65 foot height limit, you may be able to meet the density because you're building smaller units. Okay, but going to the higher height limit allows you to make bigger units, potentially family size units. Um, it makes it easier to achieve the goal of the unit distribution or unit mix that you're interested in. So it provides a level of flexibility. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry, then to follow up. So um, thank you for clarifying. I just also agree with using the drawing that you shared with us as a starting point um, for evaluation. Thank you. And then with regards to the height, if, if the 85 foot does allow bigger units, especially like two, three bedroom units, then I would be in support of that higher height. I think especially for working families, that's important. Councilmember Shubnick. Um, I just, I have a clarifying question on the um, proposal. At, well, and first I want to thank you for coming back so quickly um, with uh, what you, you, you were clearly listening to, um, uh, you know, council shift on, on direction on that. And that was a very rapid turnaround for a really nice solution. Um, so really like the solution that's proposed um, with the assessment and, um, and carve out. Um, but what I'm wondering is, does the assessment, would the assessment indicate kind of what would be the appropriate buffer and if the buffer should be extended beyond 60 feet? Is that the kind of thing that an assessment yeah, would I, speak to? I, I think the goal of the assessment is to prioritize areas along Swamp Creek where we're going to get the most bang for the buck. Yeah. Right? Okay. So if, for example, this area was an area that is really important, yeah. then what the assessment could identify is what is useful. Right. Should okay. the bank be replanted? Yeah. Should right. okay. uh, the buffer be widened? We don't know okay. what the outcome But it is. could, that could be one of the things that an assessment would identify. Okay. Correct. Okay. And then on the other piece, yeah, I, I, I do get the, I actually had the same, this, you know, same two issues, parking and uh, which of course we have a love hate relationship with and, um, and height. Um, I, and I'm wondering on the height, maybe there's a compromise, um, you know, link is 75 feet, you know, is it, does that, you know, a little bit less, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm still struggling with the rationale for 85 feet. Um, so that's on the height. Um, and then on the parking, you know, I, I get the concept of eliminating or reducing to a very low level, the, the required, um, minimums from the city's perspective and, you know, allowing the market to speak for itself. But I think what really happens in reality, in a community like Kenmore, where ironically we were just discussing how poor our transit system is, or how poor it's become, um, at least on, you know for the next five years, um, you know we we <laughs> it is not realistic that you know many units will have no cars. Um, or simply, you know, somehow find street parking that doesn't exist. Um, I, I just don't think, and you know, it's it's not a it's not yet a walkable area there. Um, I know the link area bills itself is very very walkable. I think that's slightly more realistic, um, but the TOD isn't. Um, so I I you know I'm just struggling with the 0.5 and particularly. You know, if, if we're talking about larger units and more people in a unit, I mean, I don't, I just, I, I don't know, I guess 
I'd like to say that would be great to have bigger units, but I think the bigger the unit, the more unrealistic it is to have, uh, you know, a half a car <laughs> per unit as as what might be built. And I understand that maybe um, developers would build more in theory, but um, if you put the minimum where it is, that's probably what they're going to build to because why wouldn't they? It's cheaper, and that puts the burden. It gets the burden off of them financially, takes the burden off of the tenant, and it puts the burden on the community to absorb those cars. I could just make one point. It, I would also say that you can't have the parking discussion without in tandem looking at the affordability requirement, because the affordability requirement based on council's direction to try and get to 25% affordability at 50% AMI, 0.5 was part of that calculation. So if council direction is thinking about a new direction and increasing the minimum or the, the floor for parking, we really need to see what impact that would have on the level of affordability that could be achieved. And let me let me just clarify my point. I, I'm uncomfortable with the 0.5 unless, unless <laughs> we have strategies for mitigating the impact on community and businesses. And, and maybe that's something that you guys can speak to. I, th I think, I mean, I don't have a strategy at the moment. I, I think this area is unique in some ways, because for example, if you look at the parcels, they are, there's not a grid pattern. There's not a street pattern. There's SR522 and you can't park on SR522, which means that if a developer, and in fact, we heard this from the developers panel, if a developer is going to build there, they're going to build parking for their tenants. The question is how much parking are they going to build? It becomes an amenity to have adequate parking for their tenants when there is no street parking. So for that reason, we felt comfortable going with a 0.5 um requirement at the time the if the center road goes in and there is parking on the road then the question will be well was there adequate did the developers build adequate parking are people taking up the roads now and at that point things like time limited parking or parking passes become something you could consider it, it, it's not something we would put in place in advance because the road's not even there but yeah, staff just stole my talking points. I was oh. I was literally going to make sure that we discuss the direct link between increasing parking minimums and less affordable housing um, and the unique nature of this entire area and that there is no place to spill over to park there. It's kind of isolated and so it's its own thing. Um, the other thing that, and I know that in the short term, this might make some people a little cranky, but we have to build for the city that we want. And if we want this area to be walkable, every parking space that we force to be in there makes it less walkable. If we want to build a city that caters to, that, 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 that gets away from being so car centric, we have to build a city that is less car centric. And I know in the short term, that might be a little painful and comfortable, um, but we have to build for what we want our grandchildren to, to, to live with, not um, for what'll be comfortable for us in five years. Um, also, this development is probably going to take many, many, many years before we see major changes in, the, in this area. Um, I'm also perfectly comfortable with height. Um, I don't have any real concerns around that. Um, and I do want to reiter reiterate what my colleagues have said. I do appreciate um, how quickly you all jumped in on this. Um, Councilmember File. Thank you. So since we have talked about um, this corridor in the in the sense of a channel possibility and evaluation, I, I want to move on to other conversations. So when thinking about um, parking walkability and time parking for as a potential option for uh, the TOD. I'm thinking about uh, housing and the level of housing. I'm fine with the level of housing uh, height being higher. This is the TOD. It's no surprise to our residents nor this council or staff that this is the area that was supposed to have ample height to uh, better address uh, the housing needs our community has. So 
but you know, I, I do only have concerns environmentally if there should be a, an encroachment or a, a cast of shadow that would change a environment for um, our, our blue heron. So moving back to parking, um, you know, I think that we heard tonight uh, that we can work together with uh, partners and stakeholders such as Metro and Sound Transit to to help create some parking. Um, I'd like to see us do that and be open to it. Uh, I also want to make sure that when we're talking about um, the the slim amount of parking that would be present for these. Um, housing developments that we also are being considerate of surrounding business um, and the success of the surrounding business. We might need to consider uh, applying some restricted parking times uh, for, um, you know, sh for shopping purposes, um, let alone for our, our bowling alley. Um, we want to make sure that their their business is not detracted from you know long term uh, parking or for persons who reside within these buildings who are using up some possibly potentially um, the the business parking. I think we're really going to either have to think about that um, because if you're looking at these areas, we have the grocery store, we have Starbucks, we have all these other areas. Um, and it's unlikely that overflow would not hit these areas. So we just need to be thinking about it. Um, so if we need uh, time parking in our, our business corridor, then that's what we need to do. We might also need to look at um, um, zoned parking stickers or um, uh, for residents who live or reside within uh, these buildings uh, that they belong to the area. We wanna make sure that we don't have a, um, a, a crossover problem that we're not tracking. And so if we do have a, a greater amount of transportation and, and bus commuting in our TOD, and there comes a day that there's possibly an overflow of parking from the t uh, from transportation in a park and ride or from housing that we can see where that difference is at, um, who is a local resident who is traveling through and parking here. Um, and when I think about affordability uh, and the um, TOD and downtown affordability, I was concerned about what I was hearing from um, the input gathered back both from planning commission and staff. I really appreciate the planning commission. They get very narrow lanes to swim in, um, but they did highlight an issue. When looking at the evidence back data we have from assisting households with direct cash assistance in the during the pandemic, and at what Hopelink has in a number of households served with rental assistance or moving assistance, uh, we have a problem of housing that we're not yet meeting in Kenmore. So um, beyond the under 500 households, we, we helped support this year and the under a thousand persons served. Um, if we were looking at a building, it's going to have that would have um, quote unquote 70% uh, as being affordable and 25 units out of 100 being, you know, the 25%. Um, we are not going to be meeting or matching the current demand of housing we have. I'm excited we have this, you know, deeply affordable housing with the housing land trust for the senior housing. We're not meeting family housing. And um, just at looking at that current data or Hopeling's past data, we aren't meeting the trend of need within our community. So unless we are looking at another housing development, uh, and I'm not going to call them projects because it's you know, really crude <laughs> language to use with when we're talking about housing. Um, but when we're looking at housing developments and needs, I'm thinking that we, we need to have possibly another um, housing land trust to 
ensure that we can meet that 50% of the need, possibly in the downtown. Um, and I, I see for the TOD, the plan is somewhat um, great for meeting our need for the city, but we're still not meeting our current need of residents, let alone if we're looking at you know, two, four, five, six years down the road, looking at the current data we have. So I'm not gonna say this is, oh, 25 units here and 25 units there is great, good job for us. That's not good enough for our community. And that's, that's being real. And so I wanna hold us a, a little bit more accountable to how we're going to, uh, solve our part of the housing crisis here in Kenmore. I know we're talking about the TOD and future of housing and the future of what could be in the downtown, but based off of the feedback that did come to us from Planning Commission with your support, um, we are not going to make, meet the current need. And if we don't, we're just aiding gentrification of Kenmore. And I'm not willing to do that. So I'll leave it there, but I really appreciate all the hard work. <laughs> this, you know, housing's important, the TOD is important, uh, viability of our businesses and our community and the future of Kimmore and families is important. But uh, we, we have to, to look a little bit deeper at the situation. And I'm calling out the duck in the room. Um, it's more like a big elephant in the chair <laughs> that we don't talk about. Thanks. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Council Member File, for calling attention to our immediate housing needs. It's true. We, we definitely have a um, need for especially working family housing, and we're going to have to get creative to get there. Um, so I think it's important that you bring that up and um, but where we are today and what we've got available on um, the TOD plan is meeting my expectations for where we're at. Um, the piece that I wanted to go back to um, our mayor and calling attention to building for our future and what we want to see, this is a TOD and I support um, what's been presented regarding parking. We are building this area. We can't even see what it's going to look like with the zoning that we're putting in place today. We're looking at, <laughs> at a mess of development there today and its future is going to be beautiful and we're setting it up for that success both environmentally and given given staff's work on other development in Kenmore I am very optimistic that the development will be high quality and meeting the needs for our community on height I recall discussion related to parking and height because of the water table there there is very high likelihood of a need for above ground parking. Do I recall that correctly? And so we might need additional height. I mean, it, it, allowing that additional height allows more buildings to have more space for our housing needs. Is that true? So the parking comment was made by one developer on the developer panel who said that um, going to 85 feet allowed additional flexibility and who mentioned the water table. I have no information about specific properties and where the water table is, although it does seem to me, given its location by the Swan Creek wetland, that there may be a water table yeah. issue. Again, you can dewater a site, but this, this particular developer thought that having the extra height would make it easier to put the parking at uh, ground level rather than having to dig down and dewater. Okay. Yeah, I just recall recalled that conversation that gave me, because I think like a lot of us, we, we don't want tunnels in downtown Kenmore. We do need to be meeting our housing needs and uh, want to be creative. Looking at Bothell and Woodenville are areas that come up off the top of my mind with 85 foot buildings that I, I, I'm comfortable with optically, but I recognize the concerns of other members of the council because I had a little instinct with that myself about preferring 65 feet, but we have big needs to meet. So thank you. Councilor Shrebnik. 
Yeah, I think I might be convinced <laughs> on the 0. 0.5 and the, and the 85 feet. But I do have one other thing that I think I emailed you about as well, and that's the activation of the ground floor. I mean, part of the what's been beautiful in, in Town Square is, is exactly that, is the commercial retail on the ground floor, which we insisted upon. Um, I, you know, if we're going to give a developer a 0.5 minimum and 85 feet, can we ask for commercial uh, fronting 522? It's not that many parcels, just the part fronting 522. You can park on the backside of it. <laughs> um, I mean, would that just kill a project? I just, I, I feel like to make it truly walkable, we need more retail there. Um, and I just can't imagine what building after building, even if it's screened, would be like without activation of that first floor. The, the city certainly can require a non-residential use on the main floor. Yeah. Uh, the Planning Commission talked about it and was hesitant to do so because I think many of us have seen buildings with the vacant lease space and the rents cover the the cost of the lease for the main floor, which can't be leased out. I think it would be probably uh, not advisable to make it retail. I think retail, the retail market is um, undergoing transformation. And, but certainly you could have other kinds of non-residential uses. You could have offices, you could have uh, service businesses, you could have um, that type of thing. So if the council wanted to talk about that kind of a restriction, then I think you would say a non-residential use and the design standards do speak to being able to, um, oh, well, and the link is a perfect example. Right, Those right. aren't retail. They're yeah. like a dentist office and a car, uh, PT, a clinic, et cetera. So just a non-residential use. It might make it um, more difficult, but certainly we've seen a lot of buildings go up with that vacant first floor space. Sometimes it transforms quickly. Other times it doesn't. It's just a, a question of um, the market. Any other questions? That's our file. I absolutely can support a, um, you know, a mixed use having a bottom floor be for business of uh, near almost any type uh, for uh, these business, uh, for these buildings. Excuse me, my my mind's going a number of different places. But uh, when we look at what's happening in Bothell and Woodenville, they're not having difficulty, uh, you know, filling these spaces. They don't have enough of them. Um, and if we're going to have you know, that kind of density of housing in the TOD, they're going to want to shop um, and play near where they live. Uh, so I know we can meet that need. I, I certainly wouldn't want to see a space created without some sort of almost mini park um, because we need to preserve and incorporate small green spaces uh, where we live, where we work, where we play so that we have those mindful um, uh, beautiful uh, moments in our community that people can stop and enjoy, stop and refresh and refuel or recharge. Um, and that's some of what makes Kimmore so beautiful. Uh, I think that if we can con continue this stride, um, it will be good for Kimmore's uh, future. Thank you. Does staff have, for, have a recommendation on getting to the direction that you're asking for tonight? Um, I think we're looking for direction on, first of all, which way do you want to go? Do you want to go with the carve out? If you want to go with the carve out, is the what we've presented where you want to carve it out? That's one question. And then the rest of the questions, um, I, I haven't heard sort of a majority direction, whether it's related to height, parking, affordability, um, activation of uh, non-retail space on the ground floor and green space. So there's a number of things which ideas you've thrown out there, but um, I only 
take direction when there's the majority that give it. So that's what I'm looking for direction on those points. I thought I saw a lot of him. thumbs up for the carve out. Well, <laughs> Is there an objection to? Okay, I'm not seeing an objection to the carve out. We have the carve out uh, as represented. So we will need to then spend time revising regulations. Are there any other regulations that council wish to amend? Councilor File, did you? I was just going to suggest that maybe we just you know touch on each topic and and, yes. and make a decision. I think it would be easier for everyone all around. So the topics we had were height, parking, activation, and I'm sure I missed something there. I apologize. Uh, affordability. I wasn't quite sure exactly what it was around affordability and green space. Okay. Councilmember Baker. Yeah. Councilmember Baker, your microphone. I'm certainly against the, the height restrictions. Also, uh, I'm very strongly in favor of the carve out. But in addition, we have done restoration work piecemeal. And if we're going to restore this, I want to restore this because uh, there are so many problems uh, on Swamp Creek that by just worrying about one little piece, it's not going to solve any problem. So anyway, those are my concerns. So. Yeah, I'm just wondering, can we just take one topic yeah. at a time? Let's do that. Let's do height. Right now, the recommendation is at 85 feet. Correct. Okay. And 65 downtown. All right. I think we have consensus that's good with the height. Uh, parking. Majority yes. Councilor Fowl. So there's the question of 65 downtown, which is that there we're looking at the flight pattern of Kimmore Air Harbor, correct? We're not looking at it right now. What we're saying is we recommend keeping it at 65 until there was additional analysis. So we weren't recommending doing that analysis right now, which is why we said keep it at 65. Okay, and should the analysis be clear, then we can okay uh, the 85, correct? Yep, we can, revisit, we can revisit that once we have that more information. Very good, thank you. Uh, next issue was parking. Um, can we get a thumbs up for thumbs down on the half point five? All right. Well, I'm seeing, yeah, they're directly tied to affordable. Um, all right. I'm seeing a majority uh, in favor of keeping the recommendation for parking. Um, activation. Well, I mean, the two of them are tied directly together. Do we want, does anybody have any issues with the affordability that's recommended since we're not changing the parking? Uh, I do have concern about the affordability in the downtown because it's part of the discussion. Um, I'm comfortable with the affordability in the TOD as it's described. I wish there was more of it. <laughs> um, but in the downtown, um, closer to our schools, uh, I would want to see a, a greater amount of affordability. We have plenty of um, Access housing or opportunity housing at 80% of the mean, 70% is still considered opportunity housing. And so I would want to see greater affordability, I'd be happy to see affordability and home ownership uh, and mixed use, fine with that. But that's what I would recommend is a deeper affordability at 50% um, and for workforce housing families, uh, mixed use. And I'd be um, absolutely in support of the, the optional uh, ownership as well at the other uh, rate, the could 80%. We, can we get staff just to go over the downtown affordability requirements again? Right. We've been talking about TOD this entire time. So the downtown affordability requirement was 25% of the units at 70% AMI uh, for rental and at 80%. AMI for ownership. And the reason for that, and I should say, Mike Stanger is very patiently waiting in the wings from Arch if you had any analysis questions, but so far so good. Um, the choice 
of 70% was based on the fact that when the economic feasibility analysis was done, there is no MFTE yet in the downtown area, which factors into the feasibility. And also there was no parking adjustment done downtown pending a, a citywide parking <clears throat> effort that started last year that we expect to continue. So for those two reasons, downtown uh, affordability was a, at a higher AMI than in the TOD. Is this something that we could address as we get more as, I mean, as the MFT is now part of downtown? Correct. Right? The, so the, is this something we could reassess? The, the idea was that if MFTE becomes part of the downtown regimen, and it's certainly on a future docket, then that would be an opportunity for the city to go back and, and decrease the AMI requirement. Councilor? Okay. Councilor Rafael? Doesn't that get us into kind of a messy wicket, if you will? Because if we enter into a, a, a building agreement, uh, it's at that locked in new rate. We can't just go and change parameters later. We'd have to wait for a sale of a property. Is that not right? It, it would be for new development, right? If something developed now, it would be 70% and it would that would be the affordability requirement. Right. Um, so that's where I'm saying that the data that we have, our city has collected and that part of our partners and stakeholders share with us that shows that we are not meeting our workforce housing need demands. And, uh, you know, we, we could do more to better serve our community. I like to recommend that we take deeper affordability in that downtown, in, our, in the downtown um, housing. We have plenty of, you know, 80% housing in the Link and the Spencers and uh, what we have, what another couple of uh, developments that are occurring already. The you know, opportunity housing is flush and not filled. But we aren't serving all parts of our community. So I recommend that we take deeper affordability um, for downtown at 50% of the mean. Any other um, comments around affordability? Deputy Mayor. So, a I I support moving forward with more affordability in the downtown area. I'm just wondering if making that change, what if there's any risk of making that decision at this time, versus later on the docket in a couple of months, which it sounds like it's going to be coming back up. I I I, su I support the idea for new development having a higher. Um, affordability, but I feel a little rushed with this decision right now. And that's my only discomfort because I understand the need, but I'm a little bit, I want to make sure it's the timing's right. And I understand the impacts. Right. So when we did, when Arch did the analysis, this based on the analysis, that's why they recommended the affordability they did because we don't have MFTE. So um, I think that's probably the direction we would be going, but it makes sense to do that in tandem when we look at MFTE, when we then can also then assess that it's still viable to have that depth of affordability once you include MFTE. I think if we do it now, I don't think it would, based on the data that Arch prepared, would pencil out. Uh, when MFTE comes up on the docket um, is based on council direction for future docket items. And that's going to be a topic that we usually discuss at the retreat and then later in January. Thank you. Councilor Baker. Council Member Baker, your microphone. I'm a little concerned with concentrating all affordable housing downtown. I really think that there should be opportunities outside of the immediate downtown area for affordable housing. We have some along 68th Street and Juanita Drive, but I would like to see that when the opportunity to rise to expand affordability. Um, I just don't want to see a concentration 
downtown. I don't think it's healthy for the city that we're trying to build. And I don't think concentrating low income or affordable housing in the downtown area is fair to the residents. I think there ought to be a number of opportunities. I know we're not talking about that, but I'm against uh, at 70%, I really want to see it 50 and I want to see it a little below that. I, I, I've kind of given you the response based on yeah. the staff recommendation. So I, I don't have anything else to respond. And I'm supportive of trying to get as affordable as we can. I also think that we need the data to back it up and the work behind it to back it up rather than um, just making a decision at the dais tonight. I, I think we need to put in the work to actually get to a place to make sure that things will pencil. Otherwise we will have, there just won't be any development. If we, if we put in a, a affordability requirement that just does not pencil, we will not get anything new. Um, and that is not a good, that's not good either, so. Councilmember Marshall. Yeah, I appreciate the suggestion, Councilmember File, and at the same time, I definitely would like to see the data. I think first to see what it could justify uh, before considering that. So I think I'm going to ask everybody: Are we okay with the current recommendation for downtown and moving forward, and having it come back to us when we have more information, or do we want to with well, the affordability level? Yes, affordability. Councilor File. Thank you. I, I appreciate this last opportunity to speak to it really quickly. You know, it's not that there isn't enough interest or enough need. Uh, we definitely have that if we look beyond just the arch picture, the snapshot, and we look at all the other partners who are helping people stay housed in our community, because that is part of this picture. Um, the working poor that we have two, we are a community of have and have nots. This is been Kimworth's history for a long time. We know this, this is not anything new. We know that even at the last RFPs, when we were looking at uh, the possibility of you know, workforce housing or deeply affordable housing, there were, and there was that interest for Kimworth. We don't have to go out shopping for it. It's already coming to us. And, and they're looking for it elsewhere because it has to be built next to transportation routes. It has to be accessible because that's where the funding lines up from federal to state and county and down to cities. So the, the data is there. I'm with uh, Council Member Baker and I appreciate that um, our mayor and our deputy mayor support workforce housing. I definitely think we have to have this on the docket for our retreat. And um, I'm not comfortable going above 50% for the downtown when we have many other developments already in the, in the works for deep, for, you know, opportunity housing um, and to be constructed. So we know what we have coming. We know that we have other areas yet to develop and that's coming too. Um, there's nothing stopping us today from making a decision to, to have 50% AMI available to our community downtown, other than, you know, let's wait a little bit longer. We could do that. We've been doing it for years. Well, I'm not ready to continue to hit the pause button. I think we have to move forward. And the only way we move forward as a community is together. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with anything Councilman Raphael is saying. Um, the need is obviously there and nothing that we're doing would preclude a nonprofit um, or us from building deeply affordable housing in the downtown area. What we're talking about is developer incentives for private market to build affordable housing. And the, the truth of the matter is if it doesn't pencil, they will not build it and then nothing will happen. Um, if we want these, um, if we want inclusive zoning to work, it has to pencil out or nothing will get built. And then we get no affordable housing built through that lane. But I, I still think we should be working, of course, to continue building affordable housing, um, you know, and deeply affordable housing like we're doing uh, as a city. Um, that said, is there any further discussion on affordability in downtown? As a, is there any, I guess when asked, does anybody um, support uh, lowering the affordability in downtown? Uh, at the current, as Councilmember File has um, proposed. Thumbs up, thumbs down. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. seeing one thumb. So I think we're going to, but I think yeah, it's worth accelerating that and putting in front of the planning commission sooner and later. Um, all right, uh, activation on street level. Like facing 522, is that what we're discussing? Oh, nice. Yeah, I think every. I don't think people want just blank facades, so. Great. Okay. No. That was easy. Yeah, and I think the 522 side makes sense. I was thinking about the benefits of some of that housing having yard, you know, like back patios and access to the, to the green space. So I think being specific about where it's required makes sense. I also just wanted to thank council member file for what she said, because it, it was really important what you said, and we do have a lot of data here, but we do for our community need to hone in a little bit more deeply before making that decision. But anyway, thank you. And then the last issue we had was green space. Um, what I, could staff remind us briefly what is required as far as green space goes in the uh, TOD? There are no specific requirements of green space. I think that uh, council member file brought up the fact that maybe there should be some requirements. Uh, in some multifamily zones, there's a requirement for common recreational open space, but that doesn't apply downtown. And I don't think it applies in the TOD. There are, um, requirements in the design standards that speak to the benefit of step backs and little seating areas and plazas as alternatives to meet the city's design standards, but that's not green space, a green space requirement. Councilor File. Thank you. And this is why we need to consider a green space incorporation in that downtown TOD, especially for for planning on housing families. Where do you expect them to play? They're not just going to play in, in their apartments, in their dwelling. You know, so they're going to play in the park and ride. They're going to play in, in the uh, in, in the street there, in the um, in the shopping lots. So unless we create the safe space, because we are uh, goal setted to be uh, safe, welcoming, affirming, and you know. We, we welcome families. Well, are we designing for that? We are not designing for it unless we, we demand that it be included in that. Um, and we have to work together to create those safe spaces. Um, it's good for the community. It's good for the appearance of things, let alone um, whether it's green infrastructure or green building. I don't care if there's a rooftop park, there has to be a place for people to play or recreate. Councilor Shrebnik. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is literally across the street from Chalazzi's Park, correct? Yeah. It's within walking distance of the park and um, the hangar. Yes. Councilor Fahl. And just to, to wrap that up with a bow, uh, if you have kids, and young kids, if you're a single parent, you're probably not going to let them go traipsing across 522 all by themselves and go play down by the shore. Yeah, that's safe. You know, that's how we get drownings every year. Let's just fuel that. Uh, we have to be mindful. Yeah, we are putting families in near high density traffic. We are putting them near creek and near the slough. And where are you going to create the safe space? And that's why you see that even downtown Seattle uh, incorporating some of those uh, spaces or Woodenville or Kirkland to ensure that they're safe places for, for families and, and individuals just to recreate um, and move out at their own pace. Uh, we have to be mindful of that. There is just no way as a parent, I would have even allowed my kids to cross 522 on their own. <laughs> Councilor Kugler. Can, can, before we get too far, could, sure. I, could I have Laurie speak to what the code currently speaks to for um, recreation space? Yeah, so I, um, uh, 183130 speaks to on-site areas for recreation space. And it says, if you have a, an apartment, townhouse, or mixed-use development of more than nine units, 
uh, in the, this would be in the UR zone, certainly not in the commercial urban corridor zone. Um, and if you have a standalone apartment or townhouse in the urban corridor or downtown commercial zone. So a standalone, meaning not a mixed use development of more than nine units, then you have to provide some common recreational open space on site unless uh, the following facilities are available. There's something developed as a park. Um, it's located within a quarter mile walking distance and it's accessible without crossing any arterial street. So it might actually, uh, uh, these might actually meet the requirement except that you have to cross 522. So it sounds like for more than nine units, you actually would have to provide some common recreational open space. Councilor Robert Kugler. Um, I agree with what council member Viles bringing up. And I wonder, is there a way to incentivize if developers were to develop some sort of a larger plan. So not requiring it for each individual unit, but if it was something similar to like what's gone up in the schoolhouse district where they do have a play area in the middle, like how, how might we incentivize if they had multiple, like a larger plot or multiple like apartments surrounding shared space? Do we have anything like that? Um, I see the way you're going with the concept. Um, it's late and my mind can't figure out how you would translate that into code. But if there is interest in that, we could probably explore it a little bit. I think right now it's, it's as the code is written, it's done to address the immediate need of, the, of when the parcel is developed. So if multiple parcels came in together, then yes, they could, or if that would be one way of doing it. I'm just struggling with how to, to figure that out. Yeah, it, it's possible that we could do something like it, that you don't have to provide common recreational open space if you join with a neighboring development to provide a space of a certain size. I don't know, that would be very hard to, to um, operate in code in permit review because you're these all are coming in at different times and uh, so you'd have there'd have to be some sort of coordinated effort, but that is the one way that I could think we could require it. Deputy Mayor, um, I, I, I was I had a feeling we had to have something written and related to this already. So I'm thankful that it's covered. And if it's anything like what's at Spencer 68, at least for me, seeing. I, my, my, I have a family member that lives there and there's space for the kids and it, the needs are met in, in that complex. Um, if, we're, if we're continuing to be mindful of those needs, I'm comfortable. And if there's room for us to explore this at a later time and incorporate more real green space, park space, stuff like that, I'm open to it. But I feel like it's for where we are in this process, I'm comfortable with what we've got. Councilor Marshall. Yep. And I'm giving a thumbs up on what we can do for more green space and parks. I agree with the deputy mayor. I think um, it, was, it was very helpful for staff to read through what the current requirements are. Um, and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with those as it is. Um, thumbs up to keeping the current recommendations around active or green space. Thumbs down for expanding it right now. I see four in favor of keeping the current recommendation. Are there any other issues you need um, direction on? No, I, I will say that um, to incorporate things like the carve out area is quite a task for writing code. It is not as simple as it sounds because this affects multiple sections of the code. So I'm telling you this because I'm mindful that this is going to take time for Laurie to do so please don't expect this to come back at your first meeting in January. We're probably looking at later in February because we also have other things that we're working on as well. Does that mean that we're going to have to extend the uh, interim regulations for we'll, the whole area? We will have to extend the interim regulations and we will then have to figure out how to write that extension um, for a carve out area. So again, how we do that logistically, we'll figure it out and bring that back to you in January. 
Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all of, thank you for that last bit too. I think we all recognize the hard work you put into this. So um, next up is contract number 22-C2872 interlocal agreement with King County Regional Homelessness Authority and five cities to combine regional funding for homelessness services to the King County to the North King County subregion presented by assistance to the city manager, Garrett Oppenheim. Um, as I stated last week, because my day job is with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, I will be recusing myself from this discussion and handing the gavel over to the deputy mayor to run this discussion. Um, Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, just as a reminder, we're talking tonight about the North King County ILA with the King County Regional Homeless Authority. And I'm just going to give you a couple of reminders. Of course, we heard last week from Alexis Mercedes Rank from the King County Regional Housing Authority, or Homelessness Authority, excuse me. And I'm just going to review a few of the things that she talked about last week. Uh, so here we see why I have a regional authority. Uh, pooled funding for homelessness response through the regional authorities designed to improve transparency, efficiency, and accountability. The KCRHA management of pooled resources will lead to a cohesive region-wide response to homelessness that should be more effective than individual cities acting on their own. Uh, some highlights of the ILA for the next biennium, 2023-24, Kenmore will transfer the management of its contracts with homelessness service providers to the regional house homelessness authority to manage. For the following biennium, 2526, Kenmore will contribute a minimum of $1.20 per capita to the authority to contract for homelessness services. All the funds provided by North King County cities, including Kenmore, have to be spent on programs located in these five cities or determined to be serving residents of the five cities. All of the funds will be distributed to providers and none will be kept by the housing of the homelessness authority. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> Uh, cities can withdraw by September 30th, 2024, and that uh, withdrawal will be effective December 31st of that year. And all of the cities will remain free to operate homelessness response programs outside the purview of the Regional Homelessness Authority. Uh, like for instance, the homelessness pilot that we will be running with the ARPA funds. And here we can see that the current spending, so for the 23-24 biennium, the City Council has approved $38,000 in total for homelessness services. That's $30,000 for Mary's Place, $5,000 for Lake City Partners Ending Homelessness, and $3,000 to Hope Link. That's approximately $1.52 per capita, assuming a population of about 25,000 for the city of Kenmore, which is actually a little high, so it's even a little bit more than that. In the 25-26 biennium, the city of Kenmore may contribute $1.20 per capita as required by this ILA, or a higher figure, such as this 152 or it can contribute $1.20 to the RHA and make other grants as it chooses to make up the per capita difference with the $1.20 and the $1.52. So that's the presentation. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Council Member Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Oppenheim. Has Mary's Place or any of the service providers weighed in on how they feel about this? I have not heard from any of them. I don't uh, Alexis Mercedes Rink is on with us as well. Maybe she's heard of that. Hi there. Good evening, Council. Happy to speak to this question. Um, yes, we have notified service providers and have talked to them, actually consulted them early on when we were considering this idea, um, particularly trying to get their insight on you know, what the current grants management process has been, especially as they hold contracts with multiple jurisdictions. And that's when we really learned some uh, how pardon me, it's late, <laughs> um, how holding uh, contracts with multiple different government entities can be burdensome in some ways and a desire to have a more streamlined process. And so we did notify and consult with them just to really learn what grants management has been like for their side and what it means to apply for funds from multiple gov government entities. And so you heard back from them, at least somewhat, that they thought it might be better to be able to deal with just one entity. Is that right? Correct. Thank you, Ms. Rink. Councilmember Baker, please. Yes, is this model going to be run similar to ARCH? Councilmember Baker. Is this model going to be run similar to ARCH? 
I'm, I'm happy to speak a little bit to that, but um, with your question, Council Member Baker, are you speaking to the specific model that Arch has related to like an executive board and like the procurement of fees? Could you speak a little bit more on what elements of Arch? Yeah, in other words, of the city's pool or money, and then projects are picked when appropriate that can draw from that pool of money. Yes. Is, it, is that the way it's going to be run? We, we did inspire um, what we put before you by ARCH. Um, so if there are projects that do com come up, we would, if we were looking at some type of capital project in North King County, we could operate in that way. Um, but as the current term of the agreement is written the first two years, we're really honoring the current investment. So we're just administering funds, but doing uh, larger scale capital projects would be in the, the purview and able to be done under this agreement. Um, but we would be doing that in close consultation with all of the city partners in North King County providers. So will there be an all-inclusive uh, accounting that shows where the funds go? And would that be given on a regular basis to the council? Absolutely. We are on the back end, we are doing all tracking of what funds are going where. So specifically um, where Kenmore funds uh, would wind up. That's something we'd be able to report back um, as we would be tracking it and happy to provide uh, that uh, financial accounting information to the city at any time interval you all would deem appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, um, Mr. Oppenheim, Ms. Rink, again, thank you for your quality work on this. It looks like Council Member File has a question. No, I'm just happy to make a motion to approve the item. Uh, that's on the agenda, contract number 22-C2872, the interlocal agreement. Second. I'll second. It was raised. Um, Deputy Mayor already seconded. Any discussion? Looks like Councilmember Shrepnik. Yeah, I, um, as I mentioned last week, although I don't work for KCRHA, I actually work for King County and I'm the contract lead to KCRHA. So I'm gonna recuse myself from the vote, um, but I appreciate you coming and explaining things so well, thank you. If the clerk would please take the roll. On the motion to approve contract number 22-C28-C2872, the interlocal agreement with King County Regional Homelessness Authority, seconded by W. Mayor Kane. Council member file. Yes. W. Mayor Kane. Yes. Council member Baker. Yes. Council member Kugler. Yes. Council member Marshall. Yes. With five yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. I do wanna thank you, Mr. Oppenheim and Ms. Rink for your steady work on this incredibly, incredibly important ILA for our community. And I'm going to call our mayor back in to chambers. All right. Uh, staff reports, um, recreation update by recreation coordinator, Rita Moreno. I think Brian is uh, pulling Rita up. Um, she's waiting patiently to give her report, but I just wanted to sort of let council know that um, this is the second year that Rita's come before you to give a report. And um, I think she's done an outstanding job on um, providing recreation, especially for youth. And she's all going to talk about the programs that she's done and how many people have been served. Um, I think I'd like to also give her a shout out. She worked really hard uh, with the YMCA to get a grant that served many children this year. That was a lot of work to get the grant, to administer the grant and work with the Y. That was the first for the city to do that. So I just want to give a shout out to Rita for the success on that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rita and she can tell you a little bit more about what she's done last year and what's in the works for next year. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. 
Um, I'm thanks Debbie for, for mentioning that I was really excited to have that um, grant and to be able to offer that to the community. So I'm here to discuss the recreation update memo you received, which outlined our 2022 accomplishments. And it also gave a preview of um, 2023. And I do have some updates for you since that memo has come out. And it is an update, updated numbers on the YMCA pilot swim program. To date, we have had 49 individuals enroll with um, total support awarded of $6,554. We also received our total concession fees from the Skyhawks program, and we estimated it was going to be 3,500 and actually came in at 4,611. And the SEEK grant, which Debbie mentioned, um, the check is on the way. So our documentation was accepted. Um, they are sending the funds over to us and we will work to get those funds over to the YMCA. And with that said, I know on the slide you're looking at had the total received for um, concession fees was 15,000 and it's actually a little over 17,000 with the updated Skyhawks numbers. So um, with that, I just want to say I'm looking forward to 2023 and offering a little bit more recreation and reaching more families, continuing the pilot swim program, and if the grant is um, open again, applying next year as well. So thank you. That's it. Questions? Comments? Councilmember Shrebnik. I just want to thank you for this incredible work, um, particularly the the Y free camps. I mean, fantastic and 450 kids. I'm just blown away. That's I just hope we can continue it. That's awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Councilmember File. Rita Milano, thank you for all you do to to make Kimmore a fun place to live learn and play and uh, I, I just am so always impressed by the work you do and your um, depth of love to our community so this is great news it's, it's lovely to hear and what a great way to kind of end out our meeting so thank you thank you and for the comments all right well seeing none um I will reiterate what my colleague said. Thank you so much for all your work. This is really impressive and uh, we look forward to growing on this. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. City Manager, there's a couple more items. Uh, one of which um, is um, uh, update on that uh, senior apartment complex fire. So Debbie Bent, you may know, I've, tr I've transferred the responsibility for emergency management over to her. So she's been in close communications with Kevin Lowry, our executive director of NEMCO, and he's been working with uh, the apartment manager and the residents there. But Debbie, could you go ahead and give us an update on, tell us the latest? Sure. Um, so the, the fire happened in sort of mid-October. There are 51 residents there. Uh, 40 uh, were relocated to a hotel. The remaining residents moved in with family or friends. Um, so they were hotel, uh, which and the cost was covered by the insurance by the company insurance that were that own that building, but that insurance um, ran out at the end of November. So the residents were offered opportunities to relocate to another facility operated by that same group or some assistance to move somewhere else, or if they had opportunities to move in with family. Um, so we understand there are, there are only currently one or two residents who have not uh, been relocated. They have um, been offered alternatives, but for whatever reason, whether it was cost or it was not what they were thinking, they have not uh, found alternative accommodations, but the majority have. And um, Kevin Lowry has, um, again, as Rob mentioned, been in close contact um, with the building owner and, to, and he's offered the... Um, CERT volunteers to help residents move from the hotel into alternative accommodation. So a lot of that will be going on this weekend. Um, he also worked uh, with um, PSE to kind of get that permit to the top of the pile. 
Um, so right now, the um, some of the electrical work has been repaired, but only to allow sort of use of elevators and sort of emergency lighting. There is no lighting in the apartments, but that at least makes it more comfortable for residents now to go in and get their stuff and move out. Uh, the challenge is, is that due to supply chain issues, it will be about five to seven months before the fix can happen to get power back to the apartments. So that's why the residents needed a plan to move because it's going to take so long. So I guess the good news is, is that um, the majority of residents have found alternative accommodations um, for that five to seven month period. Just to clarify, so it sounds like all but one or two have yes. found a place to live. Correct. Councilor Rafael. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the update on that. So when you say that uh, people have found housing, did they find uh, replacement housing or are they being Really housed with family, friends, or hotel kind of a situation? Um, I, I don't know the breakdown um, in terms of people who are going to be staying with families and then will be planning to move back into Heron Landing after the five to seven months, or how many have now going to have moved permanently to a new location and won't be moving back to Heron Landing. I don't have that breakdown. So it's fair to say we don't have that information yet. Uh, so we're talking about people who, seniors, low-income seniors, who've been displaced during the holiday season, let alone. Um, I have concerns about, you know, our community and meeting their needs, especially um, persons of a certain age and economic, socioeconomic uh, uh, class, and even during the, the tail end of a pandemic. Um, and making sure they have what they need to acquire new housing and not just living in hotels or um, moving in with uh, friends or family. Um, seniors often thrive to, towards independence and uh, they often don't need to give up that independence un unless they absolutely have to. It sounds like some have had that experience. But um, I'd like to recommend that we set aside some funds to help um, these individuals find permanent housing um, so that they can have, uh, so it can be said that they absolutely have housing um, and, and have that preservation of independence. I think we can do that. I think we can do that with our upper dollars. I know that we've, kind of uh, you surveyed our community um, about how our dollars are yet to be spent, but I do know we still have some that remain. And I would be comfortable um, in setting aside, um, you know, $5,000 per uh, household to help them get re, uh, relocated. Um, if there's support from co-council uh, and council members uh, for that, then that would be about $260,000. Um, I doubt our community would be upset that we care about seniors who lost their housing um, during the winter months um, and, and try to attempt to um, support our community. At the mention I, of I see staff in motion. So before they can, I guess, be a motion, <laughs> there's possibly other feedback to be had. Thank you. So I think that the, we really appreciate this idea. And I also think that one of the challenges that we have is that the ARPA dollars need to be tied to the pandemic. So the fire is not tied to the pandemic. So as much as we're compassionate and care about our residents in need, I feel like it's for me and right now, it's a little bit hard to see the connection between those two things, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't help them and we wouldn't continue to help them as Debbie mentioned Kevin is doing. So that's kind of my initial thought. I, Welcome Garrett's thoughts as well. Oh, I just echo your thoughts, Stephanie. I, the ARPA 
the final rule for ARPA has certain requirements as to how we can use those funds and they do have to be related to the pandemic. So I, I do think it's hard to find a nexus here between this, the fire and uh, the pandemic. Councilmember Shrebnik. Yeah, I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, have I guess I just have a question. Have we heard that money is the issue that's preventing the one or two people from not getting housing? Is is it money or is it something else? I I I don't know. I know Kevin okay. is going to follow up with the building manager tomorrow just to see if is it still two people or have they um, actually found alternative yeah. accommodations? I mean, I would I would is wouldn't reason? be interested in entertaining funding unless we have some reason to believe that that that's actually a problem. Uh, yeah, so I'm aware that the US government has not ended the pandemic, and this is a emergency of seniors in our community who are having housing issues related to the loss of housing during a pandemic. Um, we are not out of pandemic. The federal government has not said so yet. And in fact, they did an extension on October 13th. We are still in a pandemic. <laughs> um, and so that might be news for some people who like to think that we are out of it and we are trying to work past it. We are just working through with flooded hospitals and a lot of vaccines, right? So let's get back to the topic. I think that there is still the connected issue and should there be a need, I think that, uh, and our attorney says a, this is a good way to allocate these dollars. I would like to support these families. Um, if there's support of the council to, to go ahead and allocate $5,000 per uh, household um, for those who have lost their housing. If it should help them acquire new housing um, or relocation. And I know that um, these are people on a very low fixed income um, where I had dollars are at a minimum. So that's where I'm at. And that's where my understanding, at least public health, and of course, a quick, nice little Google search <laughs> uh, help clarify, yes, we are still in a pandemic. Councilor Marshall. I like the idea a lot. Um, I would like to see if we can do it uh, legally. I think it's a great point, council member file. I'm always worried about that. And then, um, but also I would like to see more if there is a need. Uh, and what the housing situations are before I would commit to that. So I, I don't support the um, amounts or anything like that. I just support it in concept, but I'd have to see those two things fulfilled before I would be willing to give further support. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I, I will echo Council Member Marshall. I had mm -hmm. thoughts on that. I was surprised at um, the number of people who have already, it sounds like had their housing needs met. So there's, I'm glad to hear there's been such progress, but having a better understanding of what the need and impact is on these housing community, I mean, you know, and the Aaron's Landing apartment community is, and what the need is, um, would be very helpful towards them out and making a decision. And I'm thankful that council member file was very creative in finding a way to offer for our council to potentially be able to support this community and reminding us that we are really still in a pandemic. So that's yeah, important for us all to recognize we're in a housing crisis in a pandemic. So um, finding housing in a housing crisis on top of it being in a pandemic, I can understand where there is need, but I do need more information like council member file. I mean, Marshall, thank you. That's Mark Baker. Yes, I'm very supportive of this also, but I'm also concerned with state regulations against gifting, and I want to find out uh, the legality of us doing that. It's important. Yeah, I share the, the concerns that my colleagues have. I think it's a great idea, but I think we need to, A, quantify the need um, and actually like figure out what a real figure would look like, B, figure out the legalities around it. Um, like at a minimum, I think we need to figure out those two things. And if, and if, you know, if cash is actually what is required, if there's other ways that we could help out. 
that's also something we should be looking at. But if cash is the issue that some folks have and we can quantify that and it's legal, then I'm completely open to the discussion because I think, um, you know, for those folks, it is a very serious issue they're facing right now, so. Thank you. It seems like we have enough consensus at least to explore. Um, and I appreciate that. And I'm sure uh, our, our neighbors would, our senior neighbors who are no longer in our community would appreciate that. Um, and I know that we all support independent living um, and the pride that comes with that. So in light that it's holiday season, and I know that this could impact how other ARPA dollars are spent, um, but I look forward to seeing what evidence comes back from uh, the community that is uh, either being housed or couch surfing with their families. We wanna know the, the actual numbers and what the needs are, uh, and if there are other needs that are not yet being met. And I think the only way we can uh, get through to the dollar amount is ARPA dollars versus direct city dollars, uh, because that is gifting and public funds, for, whereas ARPA dollars are intended for this kind of a thing. So thank you. All right. Um, Mr. City Manager, you had another issue? Yes, I have two more things. I'd like Stephanie to give an update on something really cool happening in the hangar. I wanted to update you all. Uh, I'd send an email on Friday and I wanted to share with our community too, a pop-up winter market is coming to Kenmore. Very excited about this. This idea came from our local businesses, especially home-based businesses who are looking for opportunities to sell their wares and get more exposure. And we are delighted to have jumped on this idea. And I'm just so appreciative. There was a whole team of people. Janet Quinn has taken the lead and a whole team of people, including Garrett and others have helped behind the scenes. And we have dates coming up. Um, and I can tell you what they are. Um, we've got 8th, 10th, 16th, 17th, and 22nd, all in the hangar. And um, we had 27 applications from vendors and the deadline's tomorrow. So actually there may have been more this evening, but we were at 27 earlier today. So we know we're gonna fill all the slots on all the days. So we're really excited about that. And um, just encourage if anybody, anybody's listening and wants to still apply the deadlines tomorrow, we encourage all of our home-based businesses to apply to be a vendor. And um, the app, you can find the application on the Kenmore website and um, a lot more to come uh, from this. And we're just excited about, um, in our new economic development approach, see strategic opportunities is one of the three pieces of it. And this is a great example of what that means. We heard something from our community and we're responding to it. And we feel like it's the perfect time of year to do something like this. So I encourage you all to come. I encourage our community members to come and support local businesses in December. All right, thank you. Uh, just lastly, um, I just wanna thank everybody for their hard work this fall. You have gotten a lot done. You got a lot done tonight. Uh, you know, you always know it's the last regular meeting of the year when you have a really long consent agenda. Those are all the contracts that we're putting in place that you approved in the budget. And there's more to come that you'll see in January. But um, yeah, I think we had a really good year and you laid out a really ambitious plan for us and we tried to execute it as best we could. So thank you for all your support on that. We actually do have two more council meetings before the year is over. So we got one in two days from now, Wednesday at seven o'clock executive session. Um, and then sometime in December, we're just gonna have a quick two minute stand up meeting in the middle of the day to, uh, to approve bills like we do when we take the month off. So we haven't, we haven't established that date yet, so stay tuned. So that's all I have and happy holidays. All right, Councilmember reports and comments. Councilmember Baker. Councilmember Baker, your microphone. There, that gives me time to find out uh, what I was going to say here. Um, yeah, give me one second. So I had the pleasure of spending four weeks with the um, mayor of Homer, Alaska. Um, 
was it was quite interesting um, seeing how Homer was compared to Kenmore because we're both small cities, except it's a lot colder there. Um, his name is Brian Zach, and it was very enjoyable spending uh, spending time with him and and learning about Homer, Alaska, and perhaps the opportunity to go halibut fishing. So anyway, uh, that's all for me. Council Member Marshall. Thanks to everyone here and all of our citizens uh, for a, a very productive year. And I'm gonna endeavor to follow my own advice again and omit needless words in saying let's, Look forward to next year. Let's bring out the best that we want for our vision for downtown. Let's preserve the best of our neighborhoods to make it walkable, to keep it green, to fight for every Douglas fir, Salal, and Oregon grape out there and the, those beautiful kokanee. Thank you all. Councilmember Kugler. I'd like to thank our deputy clerk for being so on point every time council member Baker uses, speaks without the mic. Um, but um, all joking aside, I think she's done an excellent job of stepping into that role um, and taking over. I also just want to thank the council um, for a very productive year and for all the time that you all, we all commit to the betterment of our city um, and also the staff. And I didn't get to say that, you know, proactively before Thanksgiving, but I want to say that I think you all do an excellent job. Thank you. Councilmember Shubnick. Yeah, uh, just, just echoing what others have said. I mean, I just really want to appreciate my fellow council members and in particular the staff um, that have, um, more than any other year that I've been on, which is only about five or six now, um, you know, have made quick pivots, really thoughtful um, recommendations. Um, and um, I hope there's some takeaways that maybe we can all, <laughs> all learn from that um, as well. And um, I'm excited about the work that we're gonna be doing next year. Council Member File. Mm, thank you. This has been an exciting year. We've gotten so much done that it is repetitive, but it means to be said. And we appreciate all of you so much because we can't do it alone. And, and we certainly can't do it ourselves. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate you. And I appreciate our community and partners and stakeholders who came in to all of our meetings and contributed so much. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to hit on um, was our um climate action plan and housing one of the things we we never really continued to discuss was the possibility of a levy going out to the people i would still be in support of that uh, to see if our community wanted to go ahead and dive in a little bit deeper with a a, a, a levy uh, to help fund uh, additional dollars towards a cap and uh housing um i'm not sure if any of you support that, uh, but I think asking our community if they support it doesn't hurt with an advisory vote. Uh, and before I move on to the next thing, I just wanted to test the waters on that. I hear where you're coming from, and I know that our community strongly um, supports the environment. We've heard from quite a few members of our community that they want us to fully fund the cap. My, my concern is, um, I keep hearing so many concerns about tax burden on our, on our community. And when we go out for a bond and ask for tax dollars in that direction, I want to make sure that it's a win that we're going to get full support on. And I have a very strong feeling we may have other other big projects potentially down the line um, align with the environment and we'll need those tax dollars for those things. So at this time, I, I'm not fully comfortable doing it because I, I don't want to overburden our community with additional taxes. At the same time, I, you know, we do need to be funding this. So 
I hear where you're coming from, but that the, my reasoning is I need more, uh, um, you know, anyway, I, I'm rambling, but I just want to say, I hear where you're coming from. I'm not comfortable at this time, but I understand the heart there. And before we actually get into a whole discussion, I don't believe we have, I've seen a second yet to actually have this discussion. So unless we have a second, we can move on. And I'll just move on to the next uh, topic since there isn't any other interest in an advisory vote. Um, you know, we've had a number of community members who have written in about lighting uh, the tree that's out in front of uh, City Hall. And um, that's something that I would support. I don't see that it's inherently um, religious in any extreme. And I think this is something that is very festive for our community. And I'd like to see us, you know, light that tree if we can. I don't think that's a difficult request to fulfill. City manager. Yeah, I've already made the executive decision to do that. So oh, great. Hopefully it'll get done this week. We'll see. Fabulous. Thank you. Well, with that, I just want to thank each and every one of you. It's been an amazing year. Um, we all had a different kind of flavor. Um, and, uh, you know, you each uh, have been an amazing support in different ways. And I appreciate what you do for our community as well. So thank you and uh, happy holidays, everyone. Deputy Mayor. I, um, I just want to give Tracy Benishinsky a big thank you for her efforts on Swamp Creek. And I want to just highlight that what started as a small single community event, it's a campaign event of mine, ironically, with the intention of saying what the community does matters and that we can take things into our own hands and make a difference in the environment. With her project and her willingness to drive and communicate with the city and organize over 50 events, which is amazing in three years, We've gone from a Blackberry cleanup event for salmon habitat and watershed um, recovery restoration to what looks potentially like a large capital project restoring the stream in Kenmore. That's what happens when we open the door for our community to engage in this way. So I'm looking forward to more things like this. And I hope that Tracy's work inspires others to come forward because say taking care of our planet restoring the environment it takes all of us from every place that we can whether it's how we take care of our yard at home to organizing events like this teaching our kids about salmon whatever it is it means each of us and i just love the inspiration that i get seeing one person really drive a project to something that ended up I'm so proud of this council and this staff for where we are going with the TOD carve out and giving it a chance, giving this creek a chance. It's huge, it's huge. This is creative thinking, something we need more of in this world and I'm very thankful for it. So everyone here has been really important towards getting towards that and so many other accomplishments. So I'm not gonna belabor it, but sometimes one small act it's amazing how it plants the seed and grows. So let's do more of that. Thank you. I don't have a ton to add other than, of course, thanking staff and thanking all of my colleagues for the work this year. Um, but everybody's already said that and it's pushing 11 o'clock. So no further business come before us. Kenmore City Council stands adjourned. <laughs>